Hello, everybody. Goodness gracious, good evening. We are here. Welcome to the inaugural stream, to session zero, to the very first, the premiere, the whatever of Into the Motherlands. Uh, I am so very excited to be here. I know all of our players are excited to be here and I hope you all are as well. My name is Eugenio. Some of you may know me as DM Jazzy Hands from Twitter and other uh, sites around the internet. I am honored beyond belief to be your storyteller for the next 12 weeks as we explore this brand new sci-fi setting of the Motherlands, this brand new game system using Cortex, uh, the Cortex gaming system to handle our mechanics. Uh, we are also thrilled to be here it's a, a little unbelievable honestly at this point but we've made it we're here and we are ready to get this started uh so welcome uh i want to really quickly go around very first thing and introduce these four incredible players uh to all of you so that you know who we're going to be seeing for the next 12 weeks uh once again my name is eugenio uh dm jazzy hands you can find me on twitter at, at dm jazzy hands uh and i will be your storyteller let's go around and i'm sure that our first player needs absolutely no introduction cons <laughs> considering we're on her channel uh tanya hi hey y'all uh, Tanya DePass, known as Cypher Tier, all around the internet. I am uh, the creator, creative director, and cast, because there's no way I would be involved and not be on screen. So I'm super excited, also super nervous, and I'm really, really glad that everyone's here and I get to hang out with my friends for 12 weeks and actually get a chance to see them for three hours every Sunday. Right? That's kind of cool. I mean, on top of all the cool game design stuff we've worked yeah. on, like, that's kind of cool. I love it. I love it. Uh, next up, a no stranger to uh, role-playing streams. Uh, we have the wonderful and talented Miss Christina. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Is it good? Are we clear? Is sound awesome? I, I can hear you just fine. I think you, you, it wouldn't hurt to pull the mic a little way away from you, but otherwise you're great. Hello. Let me let's sit dramatically. My name is Christina Ariel. <laughs> you may know me from the internet. Um, I play Bob on Pirates of Leviathan, I play Akasha on Rise of the Veiled Alliance, and I play Bleep on Into the Motherlands, and I'm super excited to be here and hang out with my friends, and I get to wear a cool little I think. Do I? Yes, that I think is so cool. Also, uh, is, is the inflection of the beep important to the pronunciation of your character's name, or is that... Ooh, make sure you include the sound of an <laughs> underscore. Like, mm. yes, <laughs> all of this will make much more sense to all of you all when you meet Christine's character. Uh, her name is not Beep, don't worry. Uh, fantastic, I'm so thrilled to have you with us. Can I change uh, it? Um, I mean, it's a little late, you know, we are doing session zero, but I guess you can change it. <laughs> all right, let's go around the overlay, and we're gonna say hello to someone who I have not had the good fortune of playing a role playing game with yet, but I'm very excited that I get to start with Into the Motherlands. Hey, DJ, welcome. Hi. Hello. Hey, my name is DJ Knight. You may know me from such website as Twitch, maybe Twitter, or possibly Instagram. I like to play video games and enjoy, you know, a nice little slice of STEM every now and then. So, hello. Hi. Again, I'm DJ. Pleasure to meet you. These are going to be our stories. I will never get over the <laughs> voice alterations, and I will always love them. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Last but absolutely not least, uh, not only uh, is our last player here to play and help us develop this brand new system, but also there are rumors going around that as soon as we're done tonight, he has to go study physics because he does all of that too. Uh, so I'm very happy to have uh, you with us, Michael. Hi. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here. Glad that I get to do something fun before I have to go study physics. But yes, um, my name is Michael Sinclair II. I go by Michael Critz everywhere, Twitter, Instagram. I'm a professional role player. I'm looking for more. I play on a podcast called Faith Forge Academy. Um, and I also, on my own stream, I play World of Warcraft and Magic the Gathering. So um, this is just another fun thing I get to do with some awesome people who I look up to, and it's going to be a good time. Yeah, we'll make sure and get you nice and hyped so that you can make it through that physics studying when you're done. 
Okay, that's that's our cast. Uh, I have a few other housekeeping things uh, and lots and lots of people to thank. We, uh, on the development side for Into the Motherlands, have put together some really amazing stuff in a really short amount of time, and it would not have been possible uh, without some really, really kind people who have supported us and who believe in us and who are sponsoring or supporting us in various ways. So first off, I want to uh, say a huge thank you to Die Hard Dice. They are supporting our endeavors here in the motherlands and as many of you have probably already seen we are so excited to announce the upcoming musalian skies dice set a beautiful set of blue dice with gold inlay for the numbers named after the sky above our beautiful core planet of musalia uh, they have not been released for purchase yet but keep an eye on the diehard dice twitter and website uh, which is dieharddice.com and they will announce uh, as soon as those are available to everyone so thank you to diehard dice we we also want to thank Blue Microphones. Uh, the folks over there have made sure that we all sound super good. They have sent, uh, they have sent microphones and upgrades to those of us in the cast who need them. Uh, some have arrived. We are very excited to make sure that we are doing all we can to get a nice sound quality for you all. Uh, I've been using Blue Microphones since I started podcasting three years ago, and I truly just can't say enough about them from their USB mics to their XLRs. Uh, they have something for just about every budget level uh, and every need. So you can check out their products at bluemic.com. And we super thank Blue Microphones for supporting our show. Next, I would absolutely be incredibly remiss uh, to not thank the folks over at Cortex by Fandom. So our game is primed by Cortex, which is how we say that we are using the Cortex skeleton to uh, handle the mechanics of our game. We are so excited to get to share their system with you all. So the way that Cortex system works is that it's got a, a core system of basic rules, and then there are all kinds of mods and adjustments that you can make to customize uh, the system for exactly whatever kind of flavor you're looking for with just a few simple tweaks you can go from telling a a superhero story to weaving a, a i don't know fantasy romance tale or even i don't know a science fiction tale of exploration and self-discovery don't know where you might see something like that uh more on how cortex works obviously later on uh in our stream but a huge thank you to everyone at cortex for being amazing and supporting us every step of the way and finally we of course have to thank twitch for being such a major supporter of into the motherlands making this whole thing possible we're very very grateful to everyone at twitch who uh gave this amazing group of black and poc creators the chance to not only make something together but also to involve you all and to share our creation journey for this project with all of you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to everyone at Twitch who got this thing off the ground. Okay, I think, did I miss anyone, Tanya? Is that everyone I have to thank from the sponsor and supporter side? <laughs> You got everybody. All right, I did it. I didn't miss anybody, y'all. Uh, so so that's it. Uh, so today, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be, this is a session zero like, uh, like many others, uh, but a little bit different because this game system is of course new to everyone who's watching and uh, new to everyone who's playing too. So we're gonna spend some time going through the basics of the mechanics. I don't wanna get too in the weeds, but since this is new to everyone, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then of course, talking about the lore, the setting and making up four phenomenal characters that we'll get to follow for the next 12 weeks. So shall we jump into a bit of, uh, a, a bit of information about Cortex before we get started? Um, I do wanna mention uh, a very important detail about how we are developing uh, this particular uh, this particular system and setting. So the next 12 weeks are, actually a chance for us to share a work in progress with you. And it and it is important that everyone remember at all times that this is in fact a work in progress. These four phenomenal players and I are gonna be learning all of these things as we go. Mechanic details might change between episodes as our developers kind of see what works and what doesn't. Setting details and lore information might be added or changed or even removed sometimes as writers discover you know, interesting new uh, focal points based on the way our story's heading. So it's it's super exciting that we get to show you this work in progress. It's a little nerve wracking because I don't know about y'all, but I'm used to having a book that I can go to and read the rules. <laughs> if I get confused, they ain't no book. It just does. Uh, so we're very excited, but you know, do bear in mind that this is one big giant experiment for us and we are gonna be learning along the way, just like all of you. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk mechanics, shall we? Uh, 
Ah, the magic. Oh, look at the magic of this wormhole. We traveled through a wormhole and here we are. All right, so what you all are seeing in front of you right now is a temporary little character sheet that we have talked together, character spreadsheet that we've thrown together that we're gonna be using this week. One of the amazing things that the people over at Fandom are gonna be doing for us, and one of the reasons we are so grateful to them is that fingers crossed by next week, they're gonna to put together a very interesting, very cool digital character sheet for all of our players that we'll be able to use for the rest of the time here but they weren't able to do that before we actually created characters so this week we're going to be using this little spreadsheet uh, that you see in front of you now and so I wanted you all to have a chance to have a look at it uh, while I go through and talk a little bit about the mechanics of Cortex as we are going to be using them so in Cortex there we go. The core dice rolling mechanic for us is going to be assembling what we're going to call dice pools to perform tests. Now, to assemble a dice pool, a player is going to look through their character sheet and pull one die from as many traits and characteristics as they can narratively justify based on what they're about to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about the traits that they're going to pick from later. But for right now, let's just assume that we have our dice pool assembled pool gets rolled. First thing that happens, there are no D20s in Cortex, so there's no Nat 20s, but there are Nat 1s. So once you've rolled your dice pool, you're going to separate out any 1s because those are called hitches, and I, as the storyteller, can use those to make things more, let's say, interesting for our players and for the story. Now, once the 1s are separated out, of the remaining dice, you get to pick two, whichever two you want, and add those numbers together to get your result. Just like in lots of other RPG systems, if your result is higher than the number, the difficulty number that I've, as the storyteller, have established, you do what you wanted to do. If you meet or get less than my target number, you fail and interesting things happen. Yeah? All makes sense. That's kind of it. There's a lot of other fiddly rules that we will discover as we go, but that's the basic mechanic for all of Cortex and for Into the Motherlands. Uh, so... We've talked about how the dice are rolled. Now let's talk about which dice get rolled, which is where we're gonna to go to our character sheet that we can see here on the screen. So you'll notice up in the top left up here, there are three main uh, distinctions that we have. Cortex gives the characters a set of distinctions that tell us what we need to know about you as a character, mechanically speaking. The three that we use for the Motherlands, as you can see here, are culture, personality trait, and profession. So let's start talking about those because this is what our players are going to be doing as we get to some of the character creation. So section one is our culture distinction. The first decision that our players are gonna make during character creation is what culture their character is a part of. We wanted to try and get away from the sort of biological determinism of things like calling it race or species or any variation thereof. So we went with culture as a way to sort of integrate a person's upbringing and the value of those around them without, you know, locking into specific mechanical choices that players have to take based on their biology and physiology. We wanted to get away from that for this. So right now we have five different culture options for our players, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Regardless of what culture they select, like I said, we wanted to get away from your biology informing the mechanics of your character. So whatever culture our players select, each player is going to have their culture, what we call rated as a D8. Now what that means is anytime a player needs to perform a test and is assembling a dice pool, they can decide that because their character is part of, say, the Musalian culture in our game, that that is Inherently, just because they are a Musalian, that's going to help them succeed. So they get to take that D8 and add it to their dice pool. Now, alternatively, on the flip side, because there's a pro and a con to everything, sometimes maybe being a Musalian is actually going to make things harder for you. In that case, instead of adding a D8 to that dice pool, you can choose to add a D4 instead. Now, obviously, the odds of rolling a hitch or a natural one on a d4, way higher than a d8. So if a player chooses to hinder themselves in this way by tossing a d4 in instead of a d8, they also get one of the main currencies mechanics of this game. They get what's called a plot point that they can use later on to make things a little easier and just generally, you know, get the story moving in the direction that they want. 
So culture, you get a D8 for your culture and you get to decide if and when to add that to your pool. Second distinction to talk about, the second thing that our players are gonna choose are professions. Right now we have about 13 distinct professions that are available from characters. Obviously our play characters or players here are not gonna choose all 13 of them, that would be wild. Uh, so we're, we're gonna have, I think three different ones on showcase over the next 12 weeks. But these professions range all over the place. Everything from the scholarly lore keepers of the motherlands to the more martially focused spine rippers and blade keepers. Just like with cultures, your profession is also going to give you a general D8 that you can add to a dice pool if you think being a member of this profession is helpful in this situation. Also, just like with cultures, switch it out to a D4 if you think this, this profession is going to hinder you and you get a plot point. Pretty straightforward there. There are a few other mechanical things that professions give you, but you'll see all that when we get to character creation. The last big distinction that we have to talk about is personality trait. We wanted to make sure that even if you have a whole party that are characters of the same culture and profession, you had something in your character distinctions that made the character specifically you, and that's the personality traits. So you can choose to write in a single word, a phrase, even a whole sentence, whatever it is that defines you as a character, that distinguishes you from all the other members of your culture and your profession, and most importantly to us, that is gonna have a real mechanical impact on the way you play your character. So just like with culture and profession, your personality trait also gets a D8 rating, and you can choose to toss that D8 in if say your personality trait is uh, humorless, that's what you decided on, what a character. Uh, and you're in a situation where you have to keep a straight face, toss that D8 in from your personality trait because your humorless nature is gonna help you succeed in that moment, all right? So those are our three main distinctions. You're gonna see every player choose a culture, a personality trait, and a profession. <laughs> uh, all right. That's the three big decisions. There are other sections, uh, because of course we can't just have three dice to, to muck around with. Uh, so there are other distinctions that you can see on this character trait. I'm gonna go through them real fast and we'll get more into them with character creation, but I have been talking for a very long time and would love these other four lovely humans to be able to interact with all of you. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the sheet real quick and we'll get details as we go. Skills. Straight up, we've all seen skills before in whatever RPG you've played, whether it was uh, Shadowrun or D&D &D or Call of Cthulhu or any of the other games. Skills are how good are you at specific tasks, right? Everybody in the game starts with a D4 skill rating. And as we go through character creation, players will be able to step up those skill dice to higher and higher levels, depending on how good at, how good at a thing they are. D4 is no training, D6 is basic competence, D8 is an expert, D10 is a master, and D12 is a grandmaster. So that's our skills, fairly straightforward there. They're all single words because like with everything in this game, the players are gonna be able to have a little bit of narrative freedom and leeway when they choose what skills they wanna use in particular situations. Let's hop over then next to this red box over here that has our values in it. Values is a really interesting thing that we really liked with Cortex. Basically, these six values that are listed here are the six values that we feel are core to the motherlands as a setting. So these values are balance, duty, exploration, glory, knowledge, and power. So every character is going to have these six values prioritized in whatever order they feel uh, makes the most sense for them as people. They're going to assign dice values that you can, I'm pointing like you all can see my screen that I'm pointing at. <laughs> they're going <laughs> to... They're going to assign dice values just like the ones that you see here. So 1d4, 2d6s, 2d8s, and a d10. And then they're going to get to use those However, again, narrative freedom, a little bit of leeway, however they feel. One of the things that made us choose values instead of ability scores or things that are a little more familiar to a lot of other RPGs is that these values can be two-sided. They can be double-edged, right? If we think of something like a strength ability score, that is what it is. The higher your score in that, the stronger you physically are and vice versa, right? But these values have their, their coin with two sides. So 
somebody might have a D10 in say balance. And that means that their character desires nothing more than to maintain uh, the balance between people and nature, right? And someone else, another character might also have a D10 in balance, but maybe for that character, it actually means that that character desires nothing more than to destroy everything that people have created and return the world purely to its natural state. Both of those characters, balance is the thing that is foremost in their mind, but they're approaching it from two very different ways. So these values, while there are only six of them, have a lot of leeway in how players can choose to address them and use them in their dice pools as we begin to play. The last little bit for players is down here in the pink box, and that is their assets. Uh, we're going to talk about two different types of assets. One's called signature assets, which are either people or things that our characters have with them or have access to at all times. They tell us a little bit about their character, and in specific situations, they can be very useful to the character, allowing them to add dice to their dice pool. And then there are non-signature assets, which are just things in the world, right? Narr things that we decide are narratively important. Important. Those can be people, they can be items, they can also be environmental factors. Maybe you're trying to climb a wall and I as the storyteller determine that this wall has a lot of really obvious handholds. So I'm going to say you get a D8 asset for this wall just being easy to climb. Uh, they can be just about anything in the world that, like I said, we deem is narratively important. And there are rules and mechanics for how the players can decide that something is narratively important, but that's all details that we'll get as we play through the game. So that's pretty much everything. Those are the categories that the players can choose from as they're assembling their dice pool when I ask them to make a test. The only other thing that you may notice on this sheet is this little green box of stress. And no, it's not just reminding us all why the many reasons we are all a little bit stressed in these trying times. Uh, but it is also the way that we are gonna be conceptualizing what we might normally think of as uh, health ranks or hit points or you know, whatever variation of that you have come to, to be familiar with. Stress is bad stuff that happens to, to our characters. Everyone has these six categories, but unlike with skills where everyone starts with a D4, you all get to start, and I know this, now this is true fantasy here. I know we're playing science fiction, but this is true fantasy. You all start with no stress. You have no ratings on any of your, I know, unbelievable. Michael's looking at me like, really? Uh, you start with no stress, yeah? As things happen to you, as you get injured, as you become afraid, as you become any of these negative things, we're gonna start stepping up the dice in your stress ratings. So our six ratings are afraid, angry, corrupted, which will have a very specific meaning in our setting that we'll talk about later, exhausted, injured, and insecure. So as you start gaining ranks in those stresses, you don't get to add those dice to your dice pools as players, I get to add them to mine when they're relevant because I am also creating dice pools and making tests where I'm setting the difficulty numbers for you. So the more stressed out you are, the more dice I get in my pool to make things more difficult for you. That's how the die ratings work. The other thing to be aware of is if any character ever has a stress category and something happens to them and that stress rating gets raised above a D12, that character is stressed out, which we can all relate to, uh, which means that they're actually taken out of that scene. They're not necessarily dying or dead, but they are no longer able to participate in that scene. Maybe it's because they're afraid rating, surpassed a D12, and so they fled the scene. They got scared and they fled. Or maybe it is that your injured rating went above a D12 and so you're too injured to participate. Maybe your insecurity level reached beyond a D12 and so you just can't make a decision, you can't act because you are so unsure of yourself. Whatever the reason, if any player's stress gets hit, uh, hit up above a D12, they're out for that scene. Now you can recover stress in a couple of different ways. One is any scene that is not well, stressful, right? Any scene that's designated as a rest scene or sort of a low action scene, all of your stress categories automatically improve by one level. There are also ways, and again, this is more particular mechanics that we don't have to worry about right now, but there are ways for you to make tests either for yourself or for each other to help also reduce stress levels as we go. 
okay. That was so much fiddly. I hope you all, uh, I hope that was clear for everyone and I hope it wasn't too long and boring, but it's such a different thing for all for the five of us because we're all learning the system. And I know maybe a handful of you have seen versions of Cortex, but this version is unique to our game. So nobody knows it. So I wanted to take a little bit of time there uh, to go through it. But now the fiddly is done. Thank you very much, Mechanics. Let's talk about this setting, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, the Motherlands. So, the Motherlands. The planet of Musalia, also known as the planet of Vatoa. Millennia ago, the richest man in the history of Earth, the ruler of the Mali Empire, Mansa Musa, who was, I have to say, in fact, a real person and was by many metrics, the richest man in all of history. Uh, Mansa Musa sent an expedition across the great Western ocean to discover new lands. Scholars, warriors, explorers, all different types of people sailed for this adventure and they were never heard from again. World history as we all know it in the real world continued, and the mystery of what happened to that voyage was never solved. Well, friends, the mystery has now been solved. See, it turns out that the expedition did, in fact, succeed at their mission to discover new lands, just not the lands that they were expecting to discover. See, the expedition had two main problems. The first main problem was, of course, that the Americas already had indigenous people living full lives in their highly advanced societies, so there was nothing for anyone, whether it was a curious African emperor or a buffoonish Italian explorer, to actually discover. We should say that. More important to our story, however, is their second problem. About th two thirds of the way across the ocean, the fleet encountered an enormous storm. Blown desperately off course, the crew thought for sure that their journey was going to end without them ever seeing land again. But as luck or maybe fate or perhaps an unknowable force from across the stars would have it, the eye of the storm passed over the fleet and the winds calmed and the rain slackened. And in that moment, the crew spotted a small collection of rocks that formed a shallow cave. And they knew that unless the fleet reached those rocks and secured their ships before the eye passed and the storm's fury returned, there was no way that this fleet was surviving the night. And so they sailed. They sailed toward that cave as fast as their sails and oars would allow. The first ships in the fleet passed into this cave and they expected to soon see the, the back of the shelter there. It didn't look like it was that deep of a cave system. Imagine their surprise, though, when the darkness just kept going. More concerned about fitting this large fleet of ships into what they originally thought was only a small shelter, uh, more concerned with that than with being cautious, the fleet continued to sail through the dark with only the sound of their ship's drums to keep them both together and on course. And so they sailed, and they sailed, and they sailed. And after what must have been maybe an hour, maybe a day, maybe a week, they began to hear other sounds. Sounds other than the rhythmic beating of their drums. They heard wind rustling through foliage. They heard animal calls. Eventually, one crew member shouted that they could see light ahead. And before long, Mansa Musa's great exploratory fleet sailed out of the cave and into the bright sun of a brand new world. The new world that they found was strange and frightening in many ways, but fortunately for them, the basics actually were pretty familiar. The air was breathable. The water that they sailed on was salty, but they were able to find drinkable water. There was a sun and a moon. Okay, well, actually there were two moons, but close enough, uh, in the sky. And so with the help of some of the native cultures that these humans encountered, they began their lives anew in this new world. 
Now, though all ties, obviously, with Mali, with the Empire of Mali and with Mansa Musa were functionally severed when the fleet traversed through time and space, those original explorers still felt a connection to their far off leader. And so they named themselves in his honor, they named themselves the Musalians a name that would stick with these humans' descendants for generations to come, even when the inevitable adaptation and evolution and intermingling of various species began. And adapt they did. The Musalians flourished in this new world, which as I mentioned before, they also named after their leader, they named it Musalia. They built cities, including the glorious city of Musalat, a terraced wonder that harnesses the potential energy of the dormant volcano that the city sits atop. With the help of the hyena a, a culture that we're going to discuss a little bit later this evening, the Musalians became experts in advanced sciences and technologies, particularly bioengineering. In fact, a class of highly skilled bioengineers known as the ribose arose to both develop new technologies and to safeguard the existing knowledge from misuse. The Musalians formed the core of what was once considered a human culture, but is now something all its own. So that's a little bit about our world and about the first of many cultures. And we're going to create a Musali and a Musalian cre uh, character now. So, hey, DJ, you ready to you ready to role play and make a character? I know I've I mean, made I, you wait long enough. I guess I'm going to have to be ready because apparently <laughs> I'm first up on the chopping block. So everybody gets to watch me fail at it and then be like, all right, well, DJ did that wrong. I'm going to fix it with this. So hopefully <laughs> Got uh, this I, is useful for education so that everybody else can make a bomb character. There you go. I did have the moment where I was planning out the like running order of tonight where I was like, oh, whoever's got to go first. That's a tough spot. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, there's worse things that there's worse things that have happened than being first person to make a character in an RPG. I may be sad by the time I get done hearing everybody else's characters get made, but I'll, I'll deal. Nah, well, and that's, and you know what? That is a, it's like you plan this segue. We didn't plan this segue, y'all. Uh, that is a super important thing that I want to say uh, that I, I've sort of, said this in various ways before, and I'm going to keep saying it because it is really important. Even as we create these characters, and the four of you should know this, stuff's going to change. We're going to discover that mechanics that we thought were super straightforward don't work. We're going to encounter things that just don't sit quite right, that don't settle right. Things are going to change, and that includes y'all's characters, yeah? So whether it's a, one of the developers that discovers, ooh, this mechanic doesn't work at all, or one of the four of you saying, oh, you know what? I misunderstood the way this thing worked and this is actually what I meant. I have absolutely no problem in this in this inventive exploratory campaign for us to go back and make tweaks to character sheets as we go, because it's gonna happen. So thank you, DJ, for that excellent segue, because I did want to say that to all the four of you. Hey. All right. Should we do the thing? Let's do the thing. Um, might as well. All yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. So, man, I just am going to love that little wormhole transition every time I do it. It is pretty fancy. I'm it's actually sad that I don't have fancy. one. I'm jealous. That is uh, awesome. DJ, I could just send it to you. <gasps> nah, nah, nah. I gotta, I, 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 at this point, I have to make my own. I can't use the exact one that we're using here. I That's have just it in four disrespect. colors. It's okay. You heard it here. Don't play DJ with my soul. make his own. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> wait till the break. Wait till the break. I got you. Wait till the break. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. I love it. All right. Let's go. Let's, do let's go, let's go. All right. So I've already a little bit spoiled the first part of this, but hey, DJ, what culture is your character going to come from? <laughs> Hi, my character's culture is Massalian. Fantastic. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about this choice and why you made it. So what what is exciting to you, DJ, as the player about the Musalian culture? Why did you why did you want to go with it for this first character? Uh, outside of the game, I felt like finding out that the richest man in history was in fact a man of color. It's like, well, yeah, I'm trying to be of that. Like, am I trying to be the richest man in history? No, because when you get that kind of money, people don't like you. So like, I don't have time for that. But I felt like this is a culture that kind of branched off of this earth. And is essentially my people. So I want to be of yeah. the richest man and of the culture that produced everything about this game. So I felt like that to me was a very important part of the process. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's awesome. I, I also, one of the things that excites me so much about 
the Musalian culture in particular for this game is exactly everything that you said. And then add to, on to that. I mean, remember these folks came in, you know, earth date, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, but hundreds and hundreds of years ago, long before uh, anybody, you know, from the Americas came uh, and and we had, you know, long before uh, Western slavery and long before all of these things. So this is, I mean, this is in some ways the dream, right? We get to create these amazing, rich, brilliant humans without having to deal with any of that, that earth baggage. How awesome is that? Anyway, all right, enough about that. Um, Okay, so now talking about your character specifically, DJ, how does your character feel about being Musalian in this world? Do they, do they enjoy continuing to be a part of the Musalian culture and, and whatever that ends up meaning for them? I kind of liken this character to myself in that aspect, in that yeah. I'm proud to be a Black man. Like, there's a lot of things that I got to deal with that everybody doesn't necessarily have to, but that doesn't matter as much as the fact that I'm happy to be who I am. So I felt like my character would be the same. My character would love to be of the Musalian descent. I, that like touched me. Uh, that was, I love that, yes. And that's one of the things that we're gonna discover as we move through this setting as well, that one of the big themes of the motherlands is exploration. And that is going to mean both exploring the planet and, and the stars, because it's a sci-fi game, so you know we're going to be space shipping around, but also exploration of, of the self, right? And, and discovering things about yourself. And starting from a place of I love who I am and where I come from is, I, I love that. I love that very, very much. Um, what sorts of things, what sorts of values and values, lowercase v, not the, necessarily the, the six values, <laughs> but values in general, uh, and traditions of the Musalians uh, are gonna influence your character's daily life? Anything in particular? I feel like there's no specific thing that I actually planned on, the, on being sure. like a thing that influenced him. It's just that he's happy to be here and he loves life. That is part one because that is i feel like that's also a thing that's that's crucial to me when people ask like hey man how are you doing it's like it's a good day i woke up and that's something that i've had be a part of me as far back as i can remember so like if i woke up today it's a good day so that's generally his outlook yeah that's perfect and i think that is something that can be that can be uh, in some small ways, actually part of the Musalian culture. You know, the motherlands in general, and uh, obviously there is conflict because what is our game about if there is not conflict? <laughs> but in general, right, right uh, in and among the various cultures, at least on our core planet of Musalia, it's a fairly peaceful life, you know, and technology is advanced in an incredible way. And so I think loving life and being happy that you woke up every day is actually something that is not... <laughs> perhaps not as uncommon as, as it may be in our world these in, in this year of our Lord 20, 2020. Uh, so I think that's great. I love that. Okay, I did not spoil this second part. So oh, DJ, what profession does your Musalian have? Does your Musalian practice? My profession is bio priest. All right, so we've got a bio priest. Should we talk a little bit about the bio priest? Yeah, um, please lead me in and give me all the details you have. <laughs> I think I will. So the idea behind the bio priest is that it was a practice that began uh, with some of uh, another one of our cultures, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the Manzagene, a sort of android culture uh, that we're gonna talk about soon. But these androids developed a way that they were able to see life, to see uh, living things around them as a sort of string of code. It's not exactly DNA. It's also not exactly computer code, but it is, a manip something that these bio priests learn to manipulate, add to it, remove it, repair it. And so they took this ability of being able to see life as a series of, you know, ones and zeros as a code, a little more complicated than binary, I think, but anyway, um, and use it to, well, do all kinds of things with. Originally, it was used to repair, to fix, to heal, but, like anything else and everything in this game, it is there are two sides to that coin. And so the ways of the bio priest, of these, these android bio priests uh, spread out to the other cultures. 
and and other cultures began to train bio priests and as others began to discover new uses for this like anything else this ability can be used to heal and can it can be now used also to harm <laughs> uh, we won't get any of that yet though Yes. Uh, so, all right. So DJ, what about your, uh, well, let's go you as a human in the world. Uh, what excited you about the bio priest? Uh, for me, I look, like I said earlier, I'm a fan of STEM. Uh, I, after I got out of the military, I went to school for design, which is literally like the whole Photoshop, Adobe suite, any Photoshop app, except for the ones in the last like few years, cause I haven't touched those, but the vast majority of Adobe's apps, I know how to use. Uh, mm -hmm. I taught game design for four years. I taught code, HTML, CSS, PHP, Flash. Uh, and then I worked at uh, a AAA game developer as an interface designer. So for me, code is a part of who I am. Uh, cool. So to have a character that gives me the option to include that as a part of it, got to do it. Like, that's not even a choice. Like, wait a minute. Like, wait, DNA is code and he can change it. Yes, please and thank you. Give it yes. up. I need it. Like it was, it wasn't a choice. It had to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Very cool. All right. What um oh, I'm on the wrong document. Okay, here we go. Uh <laughs> I got so many tabs open, y'all trying to keep this all straight tonight. Uh all right. How did your character uh decide to become uh, a bio priest? Because as I said, you know, this was something that was originally invented, we'll say, it's sort of a strange word for this, but created by the Monsagene, by the android culture. Um, and I will I will say that I think most bio-priests, maybe a, a small majority of bio-priests are still Monsagene, but they're bio-priests from every other culture, just less common. So what, what drew your character in particular to this sort of unusual profession? Uh, for me, for my character, mm -hmm. I felt like uh, my character is very much a sneaky person. He's happy, but he like he's curious. And so like sneaky is not even the best word. Curiosity is the real word here. So for me, if there's something that involves curiosity, it just is perfectly fitting for my character, for my character to kind of be into that. Like, what is this? Why does that do what it does? So I felt like my character watched uh, androids practicing vile priest basics and like kind of like started to try and dabble and did something i don't want to get too deep into the <laughs> to the background but he did something and it worked but yeah that knowledge is like okay i've gotten this far but i need more and yeah he just wanted to get in and go hard about learning about this new thing that not as many people practiced Cool, 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 cool. And I think we're starting to see, right, why we're doing this character creation in this order. We're learning a little bit more and more about your character, DJ, every time we add a new layer to it, which is just gonna make one sweet, because we are gonna eventually get to you assigning value dice, right? And we're gonna know so much and understand so much about what motivates them by the time we get there, that those choices are gonna be a lot clearer. So uh, this is, you are definitely not disappointing as first up, well done, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, that's awesome. I love that. All right, so profession distinction for our Monsagate, I mean, our uh, Musalian here is bio priest, a Musalian bio priest. Now, one of the things that you do get when you choose your permission is you get two step up points, we're going to call them. You can step up two dice in your skill list. Uh, that means you can either step up at this point, two dice from a D4 to a D6 in two different skills. Or if you want, you can take one skill and step it up from a D4 all the way up to a D8. You got any idea what, what of these list of skills, what your character might be good at, particularly because they are a bio priest? Yes, actually craft and fix. Great, craft and fix, both at D6s. What, just real, real quickly, what do those craft and fix things, what do they mean to your character and how do they relate to, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear, but I'm gonna ask you anyway, <laughs> how do those I, relate to uh, the bio priest profession for you? I feel like it's, they both kind of combine the idea of curiosity, but using your hands to involve the things that you're curious about. So crafting, like if he can figure out how to be a bio priest just by watching. What can he do with his hands 
when he wants to break something apart, when he wants to figure something out. Uh, so crafting would naturally fit into that. And Not fixing that. also works with that. If you're good at coding, you can break things apart and figure out what makes them work, especially if you're looking at somebody else's code. Anybody who's coded and look at somebody else's code understands like, what the hell were they doing with this? Okay, I figured it out. I'm going to make it mine. And I feel like that's also a thing that would be very crucial to my character. Yes, I think that's great. I also, if you all see me like get real big eyes and look away from the camera real quick, it's because I have come up with an idea for either a new lore tidbit or a new mechanic and I'm writing it down so I can share it with the devs later. <laughs> Thank you. I was very worried. No, no, you good. You good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The all right. Starts great. To write and I was like, oh, word, that's what happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. I that I oh, use that against him. Um... Uh, no. No, sir, um... I like it. <laughs> All right, there are a couple of other things uh, that you get that you will get to choose based on this profession, but we're going to hold off on those. And this is a good moment to introduce this other particular part about uh, character building uh, that we're doing for the Motherlands. We're not going to finish these characters uh, tonight during session zero. And in fact, there's a really good chance that the characters won't be finished by the end of next week's session one. One of the things, and, and we're not sure if this is going to be baked into the mechanics uh, for everyone who ever plays this game, or if this is just going to be a thing for us as we're discovering this system, but we're going to leave some character options that we're going to toss in as we play. I'm going to leave about six uh, skill steps for everybody that as we're playing, we get into a situation you're like, you know what, actually, I think my character is a little bit better at this thing. Uh, and I've just realized that, great, use one of your leftover points. There are things called talents that are special abilities that characters have at this point based on their professions. We're gonna choose those also in the moment as we discover, oh, you know what? It would be really cool if my, uh, I'm gonna use one of the professions that we don't have, if one of my uh, channeler talents was actually to be able to uh, turn out all the lights in this room. I don't know, I am making stuff up, right? But in that moment during gameplay, we'll say, okay, then the profession talent that your character has is turning all the lights off. I don't know, y'all. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is, right? We're going to discover it as we play. Uh, so there are there is more to this character creation process that we will see later. But for now, we are done with profession, which brings us to our third uh, distinction for your character, uh, DJ, your personality trait. Now, this is way more freeform and open-ended. Do you have a personality trait statement uh, ready or something yes. that we can workshop? Oh, you do. Oh, I love this. Prepared, did the homework, do the thing. Yes, tell us what it is. It's only three words. Okay, great. I love that. Life is logical. I love that. Yes. That's Excellent. Excellent. Um, do you want to... And you can totally say no to this, actually, because I think I think those three words are very concise. But would you like to expound upon that at all? Uh, yes. Great, do it. It's uh, in learning about how bio priest things operate, in beginning to understand that DNA is something that can be changed and manipulated. There's still he learned that just because you can change code doesn't necessarily mean you need to mm. or you must. So a life that you could change is logical in and of itself. It is, it exists. It existed before he ever got the chance to adjust the DNA of it or change anything about it. It was valuable before he ever got the chance to touch it. But I feel like just that sentence gives him more grounding in mm. understanding the value of life and wanting to make sure that if he does something to lessen life, there has to be a damn good reason for it because at his soul, at his core, life is logical. I... I think that's actually really beautiful. And I think <laughs> I think that is gonna be such a great uh, thread for both you and I to tug on uh, as we discover who this character is and as we discover what this story is, is, you know, uh, spoiler alert, I have no doubt that, I don't know what they are yet, but there will be situations, right? Where variations on on that choice are gonna be, are gonna be important, right? And, you know, do you, 
do how you know how do you approach life is logical in a situation where your life is in danger or or someone that's important to you's life is in danger i think that's so cool i think that's great i, saw, I awesome. feel like it also fits with bio priest yes but i didn't, well, want, I didn't it, want to get too deep into the priest side of things i just wanted to get into the coding and adjustment side of things to start off with Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's another, you know, it's, it's another example of the, the two sides of the coin, right? If we think about these bio priests and what I said, you know, it was created to, to heal and to help, but it's got two sides. And so the way that you are approaching bio priest may be very different from the way that other characters may approach bio priest, uh, whether on this stream or elsewhere. All right. Excellent. So those are your three distinctions. You are a Musalian biopriest who believes that life is logical. And each of those three things have a D8 rating. Uh, and you can use those at will. You can step them down to a D4 uh, to hinder yourself. Uh, and to be honest, if we really wanted to, if we really needed to, we could play a game with just that. Now, it's not a ton of dice. You know, you only need a few D8s, a few D4s. We want, we, we like our math rocks. Uh, but that is that is the basis of a character, right? And we've got enough dice to create a pool, and and there you go. You, however, do not get off the hook that easily because next we want to create a signature asset for you. So I talked a little bit about this before, but signature assets are things, uh, either things that you have or people that you know uh, that you can always count on to be helpful in particular situations. Uh, so you got any ideas about what uh, about what your character's assets might be? Assets or assets might be? I wasn't sure. So I didn't want to like go too deep into it. I was going to leave that kind of open-ended for the time being. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So we can certainly, uh, that can definitely be a thing that we discover as we play, if you want. Uh, we can sort of yes. workshop it. The that other is thing is- perfect. Give me it. Great. Let's do that. Let's do that then. We'll we'll find out what your signature asset is, is as we play. I will also say that uh, if one of the other players tonight does have signature assets that they create and it sparks something in you and you get a great idea tonight, let us know. But also just figuring it out next week as we play, sounds good to me. All right, that brings us to our last little mechanical bit for you, which is to assign our dice ratings to your six values. Now, once again, the value categories are balance, duty, exploration, glory, knowledge, and power. And you have the following dice to assign to it, a D4, two D6s, two D8s, and a D10. The D10 being the value that is most important to your character, and the D4 being the one that eh, you could leave on the road. So what are How we is the thinking? D4? What's that? I wanted to find. I wanted to first find the thing that was the least important. Yeah. To my character. Okay. And I felt like power would be the D4. Great. I love that. I love that because power is not the point, from what I've right. gathered from what you've been saying. It's not. Like you can get power easy. Like that's neither here nor there, but it's not the focus. Yeah. Um, I love that. The D10 would have to be knowledge. Yes. I think that makes perfect sense to me. Whoops. Uh Oh, what have I done? There we go. <laughs> the D10 is knowledge. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's everything that you've said. Your character is curious. Your character for all intents and purposes, learned the basics or at least a basic of being a bio priest just by watching. So they are a sponge for information and knowledge. I love that. And then uh, the two D fours or the two D sixes would be uh -huh. balance. Okay. And actually, no, the, the D fours would be glory. Okay, great. And duty. And duty. All right. Which leaves Which our would D8s. leave balance and exploration for the D8s. And that makes perfect sense to me. I do think that maybe balance, the way I described it earlier, is not sort of the way that this character thinks about it. But everything you said about, you know, just because I can doesn't mean I should. Uh, life is logical. Life is precious. That, that has an essence of balance to it, for sure. Um, your curiosity speaks to exploration. Absolutely. Uh, and then just like with power, glory doesn't really seem to figure in too terribly much. Uh, and duty, it's sort of, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to speak for your character, but from what I'm getting, it's, it's not necessarily about that, just like it wasn't about power or glory. Right. He has a sense of duty, but he also has a sense of power, just 
those don't necessarily define him as much as exploration. Exploration right. comes with curiosity. Balance comes with the idea that life is logical. And like I saw people playing around with it in the chat, but it's like, yeah, with the idea of life is logical. There was nothing said about death. Right. And there was right. a reason for that. So sure. we'll find out. Yeah, I love that said. Um, yeah, I think that's great. I think that looks, I think that makes perfect sense based on everything we've talked about so far. All right. So those are your six values all assigned. Did I do it right? Yes. All assigned and taken care of. Slightly uh, concerned because I thought there was going to be a second skill step up. <laughs> Uh, oh, I get to boost more skills. You. Yeah. So if you if you have ideas, uh, I I am cool to give you two more uh, step ups based on uh, kind of whatever you want, based on your personality trait, maybe. Or there are some that are just free range step ups. Do you have ideas for two more that you want to do now? Yes, actually. Oh, let's do it then. Absolutely. Tell us more. Uh, one for survive. Okay. I feel like if you understand that DNA is code and you can change it. He should definitely be able to consider his survival and be able to, all right, I'm hungry. It's been seven days. Yeah, okay. I'll be a little, I'll be good for a little while longer. Like that sort of thing shouldn't be a problem for somebody who understands how to change the code of right, right. DNA and well, also influence. Yeah. I think that's great. If you have the ability to change DNA on the fly, it is logical and expected that people kind of care about what you have to say about things. Whether that be good or bad, whether what you say be good or bad, you're paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I love that. So we've added a D6. We've stepped up to a D6 in influence and survive. Uh, that takes care of four of your step ups. Um, any, any more that you know now, I'll take I'll take at most two more. I do want to leave at least half of them, at least six of them for gameplay. But if you've got others. I'm good for now. Okay. I, I, so I like the idea of saving more for gameplay. I do too. I do too. So you've got eight left uh, and I'll keep track of that and you should too. But you've got Thank eight you. left for in the moment. And you can apply those, you know, in the moment, if you wanted to say, apply that at least one of those points to influence and raise influence again in that moment and spend that point that way, that's also fine. Remember these, these die ratings go all the way up to D12. So, okay. Well, we know a lot about this Musalian bio priest who believes that life is logical. We don't know their name. What's their name, DJ? Actually, uh, I think it might be on this sheet already. I forgot it's on it was your up there, sheet. but anyway. I don't, I don't know if people can see it, but I, I right. named him Ikemba. <laughs> Ikemba, I love it. Uh, I may be wrong on pronunciation of it, but I wanted to have a name that was meaningful. And depending on how you uh, translate it, it means either strength of the nation or power of the people. I, that's... That's awesome. Um, and also I will say it may not be how it was pronounced on earth, but it is now how it is pronounced in the motherlands. Uh, great. And uh, he, him pronouns, it sounds like. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what uh, Ikemba looks like? <laughs> oh, I had, I had, let me make sure I've, I literally <laughs> I wrote it out and I was like, this is what I want. Um, he is built like a cage fighter. Mm -hmm. And that's not because of bio priest capabilities. I know people would be like, obviously he can make himself into a cage fighter. No, he, um, he, he is somebody who keeps himself fit. Life is logical. He wants to extend his life however possible and being in shape is step one. Uh, he's practiced kickboxing for a lot of his life and he wears a flowing silk robe over a sleeveless shirt. And like, kind of like baggy-ish sweatpants. Cool, love that. Okay, <laughs> it's logic <limit. laughs> Yeah, it is. It's perfect. That was great. Uh, we are gonna have some bang up character art next week. I'm so excited for you all to see it. Uh, but that's a great description. Uh, is there anything else we should know about Ikemba before we uh, call it a temporary wrap on your character creation? Kind of. Yeah, tell uh, us. Well, hair-wise, he wears his hair in comb, in comb twists. But right. uh, 
And what's up, what's awesome about that is I'm actually gonna get my conquests back because I've had them. I feel like I want to fit my character. But um nice. He has a scar around his left bicep uh from a childhood trauma. That will come up with the story. Uh <laughs> but it's it's something that he holds important enough that he wears sleeveless shirts mm. to showcase it. Cool. Yeah. I look forward to discovering along with everyone else uh, that story, because that sounds interesting. All right. Anything else about Akemba? No. That's, All right. that, was, that was Akemba in a nutshell. That is that is a great start for Akemba. So as a reminder, both to you and to everyone watching, uh, Ikemba still has eight skill step up points that we can use during character creation and a uh, talent choice uh, available based on his profession of bio priest. Uh, so there are still things that we will discover and learn that Ikemba is particularly good at or capable of as we play, but that is a fantastic place to start. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Moving on. So I mentioned earlier when I was doing uh, the first little bit of lore information to you all, I mentioned that in the millennia after the Musalians alive, uh, arrived, they adapted, evolved, and intermingled with the different local peoples. Two of the cultures that resulted from this intermingling are called the Solansi and the Misagi. So we're going to talk a little bit about these two cultures before we move on to our next character creation. Now the Solansi are really a fascinating, very cool sort of culture, just like in any ecosystem. Plant life on Musalia evolved all sorts of tools, uh, both to defend themselves and to, uh, let's say, acquire the nutrients that they need to survive and thrive. Some of the plants uh, even evolved tools that we might consider predatory uh, and definitely would consider dangerous. The Musalians, being new to this world, had a very different biochemistry to most of the other sentient species on the planet. And so this unusual biology caused some <laughs> unexpected results when the Musalians were exposed to the spores and the toxins and all of the other different plant chemistry that surrounded them. Over the generations, Musalians who were repeatedly stung and poisoned and spored and otherwise affected by these plants began to notice their own physiology changing, oftentimes becoming more plant-like in some ways. And eventually, these people evolved into their own separate group and developed their own culture. And so these humanoid plant hybrids and their culture became known as the Solansi. Now, in addition to having various plant-like physical qualities and capabilities, the Solansi also live their lives generally very close to nature. Their architecture and their technology often blend in perfectly with the surrounding flora. Their towns and their cities can often be found deep in the forests and jungles of Musalia, where they can take advantage of this abundance of plant life uh, to provide the foundations for everything that they build. There is one super fun, uh, in my opinion, uh, exception, which is the Solansi city of Aminari. Now, Aminari is located atop a beautifully verdant green hill, but this hill happens to be an oasis that is surrounded by the unforgiving Osolom Desert. Osolom Desert. This stunning outpost is sort of this riot of green amidst a sea of tan and beige and sand. And the Solansi there have adapted in really interesting, fun and unique ways to their arid surroundings. Little, a little teaser, a little taste of the Solansi. None of our players are gonna be playing a Solansi though. So we're gonna move on to the Misagi. The Misagi, are another group of people who can claim their ancestral cultural ties back to the Musalians, uh, and these are known as the Misagi. Now, much like the Solansi, the Misagi are also born from the union of a Musalian with a, an organism native to, uh, to the planet, but that's where the similarities between these two cultures end. Unlike the Solansi, who evolved from unexpected interactions over generations of close contact with the local flora, the Misagi choose to become what they are. Excuse me. 
when a uh, Musalian adolescent reaches their majority, they can, if they have uh, chosen to, they can be a part of the Misajai culture, the Misajai training. They can have gone away to live with these peoples, learned their ways, uh, and, and become a part of that culture. And when these Musalians reach their majority, they are able to undergo a ritual that unites them with a symbiotic organism. And I have the name of that symbiotic organism in one of the 85 tabs I have open. And I don't know where it is. Hold on a second, everybody. <laughs> um, here it is. Uh, the Misajai join, oh, come on. It's another M word, which is why I can't find it. You're good. Ah, here we go. So. When a, uh, when a, uh, a Musalian uh, who has joined the Misajai culture reaches their majority, they are able to undergo a ceremony to join with a creature called a Minabai. Now, Minabai, full-grown Minabai uh, are, I think we want to sort of think of them as, uh, we can think of them as like stationary sea creatures. So think coral or anemones, or I know anemones are not totally stationary. Don't, please don't at me. Um, but that sort of sea creature, right? These minabai, at, when they grow, when they become full grown on their own and haven't joined with a musalian, they're sort of, we, they're called minabai medusa. Uh, so they are these sort of, uh, you know, multi-tentacled stationary creatures. But when they're young, when they're just in their polyp form, they can be joined through this ritual with Musalians and this joining creates a whole new being. This joining stays primarily in the Musalian uh, uh, sort of physiology form. It is still a humanoid shape with you know, two arms and two legs. But the Minabai influence can be seen primarily in Amisajai's eyes. Their eyes become pools of bright colors, usually a bright sort of purple or violet color, although it varies from, from Misajai to Misajai. Uh, and from these pools extend these sort of tendrils uh, in, in the Misajai's face that extend throughout their body. And that's the surest indication uh, that the person you are interacting with is something other than just a Musalian. These people uh, maintain, uh, their, their origins are lost to history. Some, uh, some Musalians say that it was uh, a necessity to uh, survive a particularly virulent plague. Uh, the Misajai themselves uh, tell stories about uh, divine beings or beings from beyond the stars that taught them this process. There's all kinds of stories about where it came from. Uh, but the point now is that these Misajai uh, become brand new beings with whole new personalities, uh, often without, not always, but often without the memories of the original organisms, completely new beings. Uh, and that's, there's so much to all of these cultures. That's all I'm going to say about the Misajai right now, because we are going to have a Misajai in our party. Michael, you ready to get started? Uh, yep, for sure. I'm let's, so ready. Let's do it. I love it. All right, so thank you. So here we are again, back to our character sheet. Uh, just like with DJ, and I'm spoiler alert, I'm gonna do this with Tanya and Christina too. I've already spoiled what culture you're choosing. So, uh, hey Michael, what culture is your character? Yeah, uh, Miss Ajay, uh, uh, Miss Ajay, I'm really excited. Uh, just the premise of uh, it. Um, I don't know if you want me to go more about why I, I'm so yeah. interested in this. Um, Please. I normally like playing lots of things. I normally play Warlock and I, this is just like whatever, but in the sense of like, I like how it was, uh, it's a consensual kind of relationship between two beings and they mm -hmm. undergo a ceremony. And it's a very like um, for the, not for the greater good, but it, it, it all comes, it seems to stem from like a community standpoint of this is gonna benefit everyone. And it's, it's a whole consensual thing. And that's kind of why I really like the premise of it. Um, and that's kind of why I was like, this, this seems interesting. This is something that I kind of want to go towards. 
Yes. Yeah. And you brought up a lot of really important points about the Misajai, which, uh, you know, first and foremost is that uh, this is not a decision that A is ever taken lightly and uh, B is is never forced upon a Musalian, even if they have been living and growing up in and among the Misajai culture. If they reach their majority and decide they don't want to go through with the ritual, they don't. They are free to go. And, and, and that is that. And third, that, yeah, it is it is both consensual for the Musalian and also for the Minabai. You know, the Minabai being such a very different organism to Musalians and to what we are familiar with as people, um, the way that they communicate is, is very different and very unusual and really sort of a, a secret of the Misajai culture. Uh, but consent is important on both sides of this transaction. And I, I'm really glad that you pointed that out. Okay, so tell us a little bit about uh, how your character feels about being a part of the Misajai culture. They made the choice to do it, right? They made the choice to to join with the symbiote. Uh, and now that they've done it, how do they feel about it? Uh, a sense of responsibility. I know that this the being is, doesn't retain the memories of its prior lives between the two, but I, because it's a ceremony, because it's the Misajai is community oriented, they do feel a sense of uh you know, responsibility, uh, leadership in some ways, and and being uh, doing stuff for like the greater good, not just the Misajai culture, but kind of across the board. So they feel um, they feel that uh, they have a responsibility about them, just inherently from like when the ceremony took place, when they kind of were on the other side of the ceremony, the being. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and. So they clearly, the, the responsibility is important to them. How do they feel about that? I mean, is it a burden? Is it is it a joy to have that responsibility? Is it something in the middle? I think it's something in the middle. I think that they yeah. they get to explore it. Uh, I, I think uh, they get to explore it. And I think um, it's something that they, they take uh, a lot of, I guess, like pride in. Um, and it's something that they, um, they're just they're they're actually quite I, they're in the middle about it but they're also equally excited so they're excited about it but they don't know what it means for them for sure cool i love that how long have they been a symbiont how long since the the ritual i would say it doesn't have to be like you know tell me the number of hours but you know yeah i would say probably give or take three to five years so not quite essentially okay. not quite essentially like brand new but they're still you know figuring themselves out like any sort of like young organism um obviously they're learning in, in the lore, it says like they're learning things at a quicker rate to kind of get to the place where they need to like be a functional humanoid. Um, <laughs> sure. I think they got to that point and now they maybe a little bit past that. And then they're like, where do I go from here? Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, obviously, you know, the ritual is what it is and the Musalians train uh, throughout most of their childhood it, when they, when they know that they want to become Misa Jai, but there must be an adjustment period. So yeah, yeah. that's, uh, that's a good thought. Um, all right, excellent. All right. Let's move on to our second choice, which I have not spoiled. Uh, what profession does this Misa Jai practice? So Lightbringer. Um, oh, that yeah. is the profession they're going towards for sure. I love it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Lightbringer profession then. So Lightbringers, let me scroll up because I not, didn't have it in the right place. Here we go. All right, so Lightbringers are manipulators of energy. Uh, and it's really interesting to me, and this will be even more true once we've had our third character created, uh, because a lot of you have chosen professions that have a lot of very similar uh, themes, if not like flavors and styles, and I cannot wait to see how uh, the three of you approach them differently. So Lightbringers are energy manipulators. Uh, they can take... Uh, energy from just about anything, although many of them will take energy from either the sun and or the moons, uh, there are two on Musalia, uh, and use it for all sorts of different purposes. Uh, there are definitely opportunities for Lightbringers to channel uh, this energy in offensive ways, uh, not like I am deeply offended, but like offensive like attacking. <laughs> um, I yeah. don't know, maybe, maybe you can offend me with it too, I don't know. Um, but so there's a lot of channeling of energy to uh, to damage, destroy, maybe protect, right? All of those things. 
And there is also the channeling of energy to heal, to repair. Although, unlike with the bio priests, where the origins of the bio priest are couched pretty much exclusively in healing and repair, the Lightbringer really is and even split down the middle. Many Lightbringers are found in uh, in scouting parties and and I don't want to say in in the army in militaries because I'm I'm not entirely sure that the Motherlands has military structures as we think of them. But you know, scouting parties and defense, you know, city guards and things like that uh, have a lot of Lightbringers because they may need to use the offensive and the defensive, the destroying and the healing equally often. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit, of, Michael, about what excited you about the Lightbringer profession? Um, like DJ, um, I come from a veteran background. Uh, I was a Navy corpsman, but that's just a short tidbit on that. However, I've never seen it kind of implemented in games where there's someone or something that kind of dances the line of like protecting the people who they, they, they love or protecting the people who they uh, are with. And then also like with the defense kind of just being offensive to make sure that, you know, everything is taken care of and like trying to, um, what's the word, like deflect threats and stuff like that. So that's kind yeah. of like my interest of being able to balance the light and the dark and knowing when it's appropriate to use either or. Um, and that's what kind of like really brought me towards that. Um, it, it, it is something that, uh, you know, I, I took a lot of pride doing and in, in healing lots of people uh, and uh, learning how to like defend myself. Never had to use any of that, but it's 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 a it's a it's an awesome thing to kind of like be able to know that I can take care of whoever's around me. So I wanted to see that in a game, and I think Lightbringer hits that note. I think that's great. That's that's at the risk of being a little cheesy. Thank you for your service, uh, and I think that's awesome. Uh, Tell us a little bit about why your Misajai decided, decided to train as a Lightbringer. They, uh, they saw that uh, they wanted to protect their community or protect any community for that matter. They definitely see uh, the world or the place that they're a part of as just a, a whole community. And they want to be able to make sure that they can, um, you know, we're going into things later, but like keep the balance, keep uh kind of like the give and take the ebb and flow of things and making sure that those things not necessarily stay right in the middle because you you know uh, in life you can never have like exactly middle but kind of being able sure. to um kind of ebb and flow and 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 be where they're needed and to uh provide what's needed in, in any moment or any um discussion yeah yeah i think that's great how long have they been training as a light bringer did they just, I mean, I guess they had would have had to just start after becoming a, a, a full symbiote after the ritual, so. Yeah, I would probably say maybe about a year, um, okay. you know, after being able to kind of function as a adult humanoid, they decided that uh, Lightbringer is kind of the way they wanted to go uh, as far as Great. being able to maintain the balance in communities. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Okay, I know that in all of your documents, uh, players that you are seeing now, the next thing is supposed to be some skill step ups, but I'm actually going to save those because uh, I like the way we did it with DJ a little bit later. So we're going to save those and we're going to move on. Anything else about about profession? I think this is uh, all really great. I don't think so. I think I'm pretty great. happy about. All right. So then we move on to your personality trait statement. Uh, you got something ready? You want to workshop something? Where are you in that? Uh, yeah. Um... You know, taking inspiration from DJ, uh, it's kind of like a short phrase, but we yeah. are all a community. Uh, not just thinking that the message I is isolated in their community uh, and that the, all the focus is there, knowing that, hey, any interaction I have saving this life here or protecting someone over here has a, an effect that's bigger than just that situation. So yeah. I think uh, we are community as their personality trait as far as thinking more big picture. Yeah, just sort of always, whether the community is the other three PCs that are with you in a moment, whether it's the Misajai community, and that has a lot of possible uh, applications and also some, some pretty obvious ways that it could work against you, that you could use that D4 and hinder yourself because you think about the community before you think about yourself a lot of times. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's great. Okay. Now that we have our three distinctions, you are a Misajai Lightbringer who believes that we are all a community. Uh, let's talk about some skill step ups. Uh, two of them we uh, want for sure to come from things that match up with your profession. Uh, but other than that, I am happy for you to use anywhere from two to six skill step up points right now. You got anything in mind for us? Uh, let's go with, I know what four, I think I know what four of them are. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think focus is one, uh, being in, in these moments where things hang in the balance uh, and it's it's right here, it's right now. I think yeah. focus is definitely something that they need to have um, yeah. to make the right judgment calls. Influence, um, you know, you're seen as, for this person who's in, uh, the Misa Jai, they're, they're seen as a, a leader and also being a light bringer, they're also seen as, Hey, this person takes care of us and generally is like emotionally mature in the sense of knowing when to do what's right in the moment yeah um influence uh i said influence uh focus i have uh survive uh kind of taking sure. the 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 inspiration of this is just one being, but they came from two. And so kind of, I feel like the survival instinct might be a little bit stronger in the sense of, you know, we became this thing and we want to make sure that, uh, you know, there was a, a, the community came together as a whole to, to bring us because they saw something in, in us. So I think, uh, I think their survival was pretty high. Um, Makes sense to me. And then fight. Uh, sure. Know, because that's kind of where they, 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 they are in, yeah. Yeah, comes with it. All right, so that is four. Uh, you've got eight, just like DJ, you've got eight points left that we can toss in during gameplay. But mm -hmm. I think those four make perfect sense based on what we know about this character so far. Mm -hmm. All right, next step, uh, signature asset. We can put this off. If you have ideas, we can do it now. How are you feeling about that? Uh, put this off. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is perfectly fine. Uh, let me just make a note. Make sure we do that. Okay. Uh, so we'll skip signature assets for now, which leaves us up to your values. Let's take care of your values. Uh, yeah. Once again, balance, duty, exploration, glory, knowledge, and power. What you okay. think? I was fiddling a lot with this uh, while you, you were working with DJ. I think glory is going to be the D4. I think they're not interested in that if everything kind of functions well between communities and it all works out they don't need the pat in the back they don't need the the acknowledgement they just they're very content of making sure uh balance is there and, and that being said balance i think that's the top end i think yeah balance being the top end uh when you said balance can mean many things uh and in fact for this person they see it the same way in in the little transactions that they have it, in these little moments, these dangerous moments, and in these big discussions. I think uh, they see balance from a very big picture kind of way. Um, yeah. Dropping down from that, I think duty is uh, the one that's below D10. I, I don't know how much we get allocated uh, for each thing. Uh, so you have left, you've got two D6 and two D8s to allocate. Perfect. Um, and then knowledge, um, because being able to have the right make the right call at the right time. I think uh, that's important for them. Okay. And then that would leave exploration and power at D6s. Did I do that right? Yeah, I believe so. And they, okay. they do think that power is important in the sense of being able to have people listen to them in the moment or being able to kind of make a change where they need to. Um, and exploration, just being able to reach out to other communities. And I think that's where they see all these this is where I see all the traits for this character. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. Okay, so balance uh, D6. Uh, sorry, I lost my place. Balance D10, duty mm -hmm. D8, exploration D6, glory four, knowledge eight, and power six. Did I do that right? Because I kind of lost track at one point. Mm, yes, I think yes. that is correct. Everything yeah. I said makes sense based on how you've described your character, but I wanted to be sure we were on the same We're page. good. <laughs> all right, excellent. So that's your values. Uh, and remember all those values are, are a two-sided coin. Uh, so use at will as we press through uh, the coming weeks in gameplay. Mm -hmm. All right, we know so very much about this Misa Jai Lightbringer who believes that we are all community. Uh, we do not, however, know their name. What's their name, Michael? Uh, I lie. Um, so it's uh, I-L-A-Y. Um, 
kind of taking inspiration. Uh, it's not pronounced the same, but the letters are kind of close or similar. Um, we, the name is Lightbringer and I'm half Filipino and I'm half black. So Ilau is the word for light in Tagalog. So I just switched the letter out. I do that with many of my characters uh, with different things. If so I just take a saying or a word. And so this one I'm doing Ilai, just kind of like a, it feels more uh, like a Musilean uh, type of uh, name or word. And so I'm kind of just combining the two things. I love that. Now tell me the truth though. Did you a little bit do it to confuse everybody because the I and the L look like the same letter when you capitalize the I on a computer? You're welcome. Yes. I had to like, <laughs> I had to type to people like dashes. I was like, I dash L dash A, like just so that people you, can figure that out. You did that for our brilliant artist, Vanessa. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, like the I lay, like the iPhone or the I, oh no, it's, it's I lie. Okay. That's better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. I love it. All right. So, uh, uh, I lie. Fantastic. And, uh, gender pronouns for I lay. This I is lie, difficult. Sorry. Um, I yeah. think, I don't know if this is okay, but I think I might come back to that. I think yeah, if that's of okay it by everyone, that's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I might need to do some little bit more research or reaching out to some yeah. people, but I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I approach this character correctly. So I'm going to wait on that. I think that's great. I think that's great. And and I hope you don't mind me saying that you and I have talked already a little bit today about uh, Eli's, uh gender. And I, I am looking forward to continuing to explore, to explore it with you and, and to figuring out sort of where that is. Um, mm -hmm. It is important, and, and Dave and Tanya and I have all talked about this as well as we've been developing. You know, it's important that this setting is really in many ways, everything that we are always saying we wish we had in, t in tabletop role-playing game settings, right? And one of the things we talk about that we wish we always had is a world where minority groups are, the, the fact that they exist is not notable, right? Whether that's uh, a queer person or a black person or a, a non-binary person, right? And so, we're going to continue to talk and we're going to continue to do this and we're going to do it carefully and respectfully. But one of the things that I want everyone to know about the motherland setting is that the default assumption of a binary gender system does not exist. There are people who identify as male, there are people who identify as female, but it is not the default assumption of anywhere, anywhere in this setting that you're going to choose one of those two. So, Thank you, Michael, for helping us to sort of explore and figure out how that works and how we're going to go with that. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing, even even if you know, I, I lie decides to uh, identify as male. This is a really important and great conversation for us to have as we develop this system. Yeah, of so, course. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, uh, you want to tell us uh, quickly what I lay? I lie. I keep wanting to say I lie because I made a joke about it. Now I can't get away from it. Tell us what I lie looks like. <laughs> um. Yeah. Um. I had this character uh, look a little bit more on the male presenting spectrum, but also kind of andro androgynous. Um, so kind of somewhere there, they're bald. Um, they um, they have like a, a bro, they have kind of traditional clothing, but it, it leaves a lot of room for their arms because they're gonna be doing things, uh, but they also need to represent like, hey, I'm a significant person in a community. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of uh, thing that I have for this character. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of how I wanna go forth with them. Uh, Excellent. Anything else we should know about Eli? Um, I think we touched on all the little things uh, and we Great. did ask, yeah, we did ask that stress is your deal uh, <laughs> as a D, <laughs> as, 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 yeah, as a GM, yeah. like, yeah, that's, that totally works. Um, Great. But I think, yeah, I think that's uh, everything I'd like to do. All right. Uh, and again, you've got eight skill step points and a profession talent that we will discover as we, as we continue to play. Awesome. All right, friends. So that's two of our four characters created. Three of our however many cultures we have discussed. Uh, we still have two cultures that we have yet to touch on and two characters to create. Uh, but we are about halfway through this evening's programming. Uh, so we're going to take a brief, we're going to call it, because I asked if we wanted five or ten, and somebody told me eight. So we're taking an eight-minute break, <laughs> y'all, because we do what we want. Uh, we will be back in approximately eight minutes to talk more about cultures, about settings, 
upsetting about lore and to find out who Miss Tanya and Miss Christina are playing. Uh, hey. So don't go anywhere. Go get yourself a, a drink, be it uh, hydrate, get you some water. If it is uh, a time that you are comfortable having a libation, go do that. Take a bio break, stand, stretch, take care of yourself. And we will see you back here in about eight minutes. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.
Whew, that was a trip. Uh, hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm so happy that we are all back here uh, and we're going to dive right back in. Thank you all. I hope you all had a, a lovely break. Thank you all for your very kind words in chat. You're all very, very sweet. Uh, and let's let's dive in. We got more to do and an hour and 15 minutes to do it. And oh boy, here we go. Um, all right. So we've been talking about various cultures. And so far, we've gone through three of the cultures in the motherlands. The Musalians, who are <clears throat> the original, uh, the descendants of the original explorers from Mali uh, that came to this planet. We have the Solansi, <clears throat> who are Musalians who have integrated their biology with local flora and become plant-human hybrids. We have the Misajai, who are uh, Musalians who decide to become one uh, with a symbiotic creature uh, to create a whole new being. This next culture that we're going to talk about is the last culture that owes its existence to the arrival of the Musalians, but in a slightly different way than any of the ones that we've talked about so far. The Manzagene culture, which I've mentioned real briefly before, but the Manzagene culture, the exact details of how and why they were originally created is lost to time. But what matters is that centuries ago, the Musalians had advanced their, tech, their knowledge of technology and bioengineering to a point where they were able to create fully sentient, independently thinking companion androids. Now, these creations of ceramic and silicone were created as partners and equals to their creators, the, the Musalians. And over time, after these beings were created, they, the Manzagene developed a society and a culture all their own, one that particularly values all different expressions of art as a central motivator. You see, as, as synthetic creatures, as androids, they don't have the same biological needs of food and water and sleep that Musalians need. And so the sort of biological imperative to seek out uh, you know, shelter and food and security isn't as present in the Manzagene. The Manzagene, many of them anyway, we can't speak for all of them, of course, but many of them have filled that, uh, I don't know, that space where humans have biological imperatives with, you could call it a creation imperative, you could call it a beauty imperative. They dedicate themselves to the creation of art and beauty. And that's sort of where their culture centers. Now, obviously not every Manzagene, uh, is all about that, but that's sort of where the Manzagene culture as a whole lies. The Manzagene are this, have created this culture as we go a little bit further that is a fascinating sort of amalgam of the culture of their flesh and blood creators, the Musalians, but also their own unique outlook as these nearly eternal, uh, assuming that nothing terrible happens to the mechanical beings. For example, the Manzagene culture has a concept of physical beauty, but it is very different than what we might think of, uh, although we all have our own standards of beauty anyway, but the Manzagene, their cultural touchstone for physical beauty is having your original body with all of the original materials still intact. Beauty is, is solid construction. Beauty is longevity to these people. And some Musali, uh, some sorry, Manzagene take this standard sort of to an extreme. They, they value their own personal sort of traditional beauty so much that many Manzagene would rather leave superficial damage unrepaired rather than risk having new materials introduced into their construction to repair that damage. So you will often see uh, older Manzagene that have scars and tears and breaks and cracks. And that is beautiful to them because they, despite their hardships, have maintained their original form. There is an exception to this though in the Manzagene culture. And that is a Manzagene's face. Unlike every other part of their being, 
Faces are where Amanzagene can really shine through in originality, in individuality, and in expression. Many Manzaganes have at least a small collection of many different faces that they can swap out at will depending on their mood, depending on the situation that they're in, depending on how they're feeling that day. And these various faces allow them to express their, individual, their individuality and their style. Now, there is, like with every other culture, so much more to the Manzagene, but I want to find out about one Manzagene in particular. Christina, you ready to create your character? I am. I'm very excited. Me too. Let's do the thing. So, I am three for three. So I am three for three in spoiling the culture, and I know that I'm also going to be four for four when we're done, but I'm all ask the question anyway, because now I've started it as a thing. Hey, Christina, what culture is your character from? I'm playing the Montagene. <gasps> what a shock. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what intrigued you, Christina, about the Montagene culture. For me, it's just the idea of playing an android, and it's just exciting to me. It's just, I wanted to, I want to have an appreciation for beauty, but I also just wanted to play a really firm character. Yeah. Yes, well, I, I think you picked the right culture for that, I must say. Uh, physically, literally, figuratively. Um, cool. I love it. What does, how does your Manzagene feel about being Manzagene, both both in terms of how do they feel about being uh, a, a synthetic organism, but also just how do they feel about sort of the, the tenets and the traditions uh, that many Manzagene hold, uh, hold dear? I think for her, it's an honor. It's an honor to be able to break yourself down, to build yourself back up, mm. to essentially be technology, but to be beauty at its core. And yes. it's a powerful feeling to be that self-confident because you know your code is perfection. Yeah, yeah. And you want other people to be on that level as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. It's, you know, DJ talked about, about Ikembe uh, loving who they were and it sounds like your Manzagene character does also, but but in a in a way that is tied to not just who they are inside, but literally physically who they are and who they have been able to make themselves. I think that's really cool. It's very arc android, very excited about it. Have oh. been listening to that like all morning to kind of kind of get there and see where I'm at with it. And just yeah. having like, that vibe in my head, like that, dirty computer, everything is just Oh, thank you, Janelle yeah. Monet, for inspiring my character. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Shout out to Janelle Monet. Um, cool. Is there anything? Uh, is there anything about um, about this Manzagene that uh, that we should know in terms of their relationship to the other Manzagene around them? One of the things that I didn't talk about when we were discussing the Manzagene is that um, as fully sentient, fully independent uh, creatures, they do have a concept of, uh, and this, this may not be something that your character has anything to do with, but I think it's cool and I forgot to mention it earlier, so I'm gonna talk about it now. Uh, the Manzagene have a concept of uh, relationships and love and romance. Uh, often, and again, not always, but often in the Manzagene culture, uh, it, is, it is very common for Manzagene to form romantic triads uh, as opposed to just pairs or couples. Uh, and there's all kinds of cool details that, that we'll, we'll find out more along the road, more down the road about how uh, new Manzagene are created but is there is there any other is there a special or some special manzagene in your character's life myself such a good answer <laughs> yes yes yourself i love that <laughs> all right uh well let's move on from culture then i think we've got it pretty firmly established uh that this character is a is a manzagene is a is an android uh what profession does this manzagene practice well, 
I know that you all know nothing about this and you've never heard of it before, but a bio priest. <laughs> oh, oh, I think you're going to have to tell us all about that, Christina. We don't know anything about bio priest. <laughs> um, no, but I'm really excited. We were just talking about this in the break. I am really excited for you to also be playing a bio priest alongside Akembe, alongside DJ's character, because... And I've said this several times about all kinds of different mechanics in this game, but everything has at least two faces, right? Everything is at least a two-sided coin. So your bio priest, I have no doubt, is going to approach things very differently from Akembe. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about how you about why you, Christina, chose bio priest. It was as I was going through everything. It was. I don't know, it was powerful to me, it was beautiful. And I love the idea of seeing in code and existing and judging things based on that, like beauty and code, like oh. what makes you who you are. And I think it's interesting going back to a DJ's character is that he learns from other bio priests. So there's no one particular way to do anything in this setting. So I'm interested yeah. to kind of tackle that and just kind of see the ways in which we differ. I think that is so cool, yes. Uh, using your abilities as a bio priest to help create or maintain beauty, what a cool way to approach those abilities. I love that. Um, okay, I, I, have, I have a sense that perhaps the character's reasons are going to be very similar, but is there anything else we should know about why your Manzagene character decided to train uh, to become a bio priest? Now, as a Manzagene, they were the ones that originally created the practice of bio priest, so it's a little more common for them, but what it, is there anything else in particular that drew them to that profession? I think she saw a freedom or power in it. Ah, and to try and continue to grow within the community and set herself apart as exceptional. It was, why not go this route? Ah, so seeing, seeing, yeah, absolutely. Seeing the freedom to make changes and to do things to stand out. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, how long do you think they've been seriously training as a, as a, I think you've used she, her pronouns for her before, yes? Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So how long has she been uh, actually diligently training as a bio priest? I would say, honestly, she's still a novice, but you could not tell her that. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so excited about this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And frankly, to Amanzagene, who, you know, like I said, uh, removing uh, the possibility of, you know, dire bodily harm, they don't age, so they're going to be around for a while. So a novice and a quote unquote new bio priest to Amanzagene might mean something very different than it does to a Musalian like Ikembe. Um, but again, like you said, don't, don't tell her she's a novice. I love it. Absolutely not. And I think there's one really cool aspect, and I know we're not there yet, but with the drawings from Pleasantly Twisted, there are these really awesome aspects where like her braids are, some are braids and some are actually wires. So the different pieces, there's wires and everything that kind of makes up. So even her hair is technology. That's so cool. Uh, if y'all that are watching and the other players couldn't tell, I did not know that about Christina's character and I am all in. That is awesome. Um, yes, okay, so uh, I'm super excited to talk more about them braids. Uh, but before we get there, uh, let's do our, our third and final distinction, which is your personality trait statement. Something tells me you've got one up your sleeve already. Is that a bad assumption? Do it. Oh no, I've got it. Oh yeah, do it. Absolutely. Tell us what it is. <laughs> do it right or get out of my way. Way. Oh, yes. That's a whole mood. Anyway. Um... Sorry for the extra. <laughs> uh, yes. Do it right or get out of my way. I love that. Um, anything you want to add on or tell or, or expound upon with that statement for her? Um, I think in going, like we're talking about character creation. And I think for me, I'm, I've always, I've told you all this. I've always play a very affable character who is kind of docile and agreeable. And I don't want to do that. I want yeah. to be 
strong and dominant and also slightly bewitching. But I just, I think, but I also can't, I don't want to, I'm not going to pigeonhole in that way and say that there's no room for growth, but for starters, it, like this is just how she operates, how she gets through the world and she takes the power that she desires. And if good it's not for there, her. and if you're not going to do it, let me do it right because I'll do it right the first time. Yes, 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 yes. I love that. And just like as we've seen with the other two characters, all three of these things with this personality trait distinction uh, in particular, I can absolutely see how you're going to grab that D8 and toss it into your dice pools, and I can absolutely also see how you go grab that D4 for that one and add it into your dice pools. Right? Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. this is a brilliantly two-sided personality trait uh, distinction, and I, I I can't wait to meet her more and to get to know her more. Um, cool. All right. Well, it sounds like you have some plans for this, so we are on to signature assets. You got ideas? Right. As far wait, which ones are you talking about? Mm. Uh, signature assets. We're not on values yet. We're gonna. I think maybe maybe something about your your braids were gonna be an asset. Yes. Uh, I think that they actually will. Is this possible? Because I think it would be really awesome if Probably. they could work as a weapon as well. Hell yes, they can. All right. Fuck so yeah. tell me. Oh my God. Yes. Sorry. All right. So. That's, that's all right. We get one. So there's our one. Uh, uh, so, okay. Awesome. Uh, Where I was my this. bleep, DJ? Dang. <laughs> I'm muted. I didn't know to be ready for the. <laughs> is all I'm saying. I wasn't Snoozing. prepared. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> Here, let me give you a couple. Okay. Oh, good. That'll cover Yo, us. Here for you. That'll cover us for a while. That's perfect. I love it. Um, <laughs> Yes. Okay. So your your braids uh, are going to be your signature asset, and what you've described is that they some or all of them are are wires are like cables. No, only only some pieces. So there's different pieces that'll be in the golds and in the silvers, and they're cool. gonna fly out. Yes, because they're gonna fly programmed out. them that way. I love Can it. You imagine okay, so choking somebody with your braid. Ah! I'm gonna keep that for later. Uh, yes, so you, we have these braids that are programmed to be weapons, defensive or offensive, whatever. Um, did did you imagine that there were other things that they could do? I have all kinds of mechanical ideas right now, but I'm curious if you had planned for them to do other things. The sky's the limit. Great. I'd that also exactly like to throw in there that she also alternately, just in case my hair changes, has an afro too. And that also will have different pieces and will work to that effect just yes, in case. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and prepare for all situations. <laughs> I love that. And I think you're absolutely right. I think, and this is a this is a, something that we are still uh, working on and developing, uh, but I do think that this signature asset of your braids, I think the sky is in fact the limit and one of the ways that we can and I'll talk about this at the end of tonight's stream, but one of the ways that we can examine character advancement, one of several ways that we can examine character advancement uh, for your character, Christina, is to add things, add abilities to the braids. I think that's a fantastic template for us. Uh, do you have a second signature asset or did you want to do a single one with a slightly higher die rating? Mm. No, I think I'd like to do something else. Just kind of... Yeah. Ooh, what can I do? I was I was really excited to like kind of figure out who she is with you. Uh, yeah, well, and we can totally you know we can save one. We can, we'll 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 give the braids a d six, and then we can save your other d six asset for gameplay if you want. Or we can talk about it now, and we can talk. Oh, we got time. It's only what three after eight. We can spend a little more time working on it if you like. I do like the idea that her monocle kind of works oh. as far as reading code. So I think the being able to kind of bring that piece down instead of using her eyes and now she has programmed this. So when she's trying to read through, she's able Very to kind of cool. see through the BS. Oh yeah, okay, that's interesting. So it can maybe see through, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, misleading code and it can sort of get to the heart of things. That's kind of cool. 
Oh, oh, hold oh, on, one. hold yeah. on. Sorry, here it is. Uh, no, I'm excited. I'm so ready. <laughs> oh, I would like to think that part of her is made up of a lie detector. <laughs> yes, oh. okay. She has okay. fixed herself at some point, a part of her, and it has become a part of her, the lie detector. Okay, okay. Does that feel like maybe a, a monocle thing? Yes, it is. It's not going to be like she just can do that, but it's something that's programmed when she had that part programmed into her. She can pull it down and use it for life. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. And so you've programmed this, you pull it down and you get all of these readings, right? You get heart rate, you get pupil dilation, you get, you get palm moisture, you get all of these things, right? Uh, when you want to activate that. And so that's going to be uh, that's going to be your second D6 signature asset. I think that is cool AF. I'm not going to say it because we've already used it. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yes. All right. So weapon braids, lie detector monocle. Maybe I should be more specific here on this sheet. So I'm going to do that. Um, weaponized braids and uh, whoops. Here we go. Lie detector monocle. Yes. Oh, text wrapping is important. Mm hmm here it is yes do it that way thank you all right i love that i feel like we have a very cool idea of who this manzagene is uh sort of in general so let's solidify that up a little bit and hop up to our six values you got some ideas on how you're going to sort these yes so let's go with Power being the biggest. Sure. Sorry. That makes sense. No, and I think that's absolutely right based on everything you've said. Knowledge. At a at a D eight at that point, like next next highest. Yeah, let's do a D eight for knowledge. Okay, I like that. And then. I'd like to think that as an Android, she's got a little bit of balance, no matter how her program, she's evolved over time. I think she still has some balance. I think that's great. And I think that's a really good example of picking a value, like outside of the you know two-sided coin aspect of the values. I think this is a really cool way to explore a value that is important to you that maybe sometimes you kind of wish wasn't. Mm hmm. I think that's really cool. I like that a lot. What a hindrance. Uh, all right. So we got what do we have left? Duty, exploration, and glory. Two D6s and a D4. All right. So D4, I'm going to go glory. D4, even glory. If she likes, yep. Even if she likes adoration, it's not her whole thing. Sure, sure. Uh, then let's go D6 in exploration. Yep. And then that leaves you a D6 for duty as well. Does that feel good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this, I think absolutely power uh, because you are competent, you are strong, you are capable. Uh, and so if that means that you have to take the power in the situation to get, I think I can say shit, get shit done, uh, then yeah, do it. Absolutely. Uh, and meanwhile, glory, it's not, you know, adoration is one thing, but it's, you know, you're doing it because it's the way it needs to be done. It's the way it should be done. And you can. So because do it. I can. Because you can. Absolutely. I love this. I love this. I think that's great. All right. So we now know all kinds of things about our, uh, about our Manzagene bio priest uh, who is fond of telling people to do it right or get out of her way. Uh, let's find out what she's named, shall we? <laughs> her name is Sila 919. Sila 919. And uh, does, she, uh, does she insist upon the full name at all times? She or does, does she allow she... nicknames? <laughs> Get it, Sila Cylon. But no, um, 
Oh, I already told Tanya when we were in a in a developer's writer room once that there is at least going to be one time that I slip up and just call you Cylon. <laughs> it's essentially, thought I was a little too on the nose, but um, I love it. I mean, maybe, but I love it anyway. <laughs> I, I think it's it's kind of one of those things where if someone does call her Sila, she will say nine one nine and ah. correct them. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, all right. So we've got her name. We know that she uses she, her pronouns. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what she looks like? We've already got the idea that she has these braids and, and this monocle. Uh, and I know lots of folks have seen uh, uh, Pleasantly Twisted's brilliant art, but why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Sila looks like? I think, so her work uniform is what you saw in the character art. And that's the white turtleneck, the underbust, the monocle, the braids that are weaved out with different pieces. They're adorned with golds and silvers throughout. There's actual pieces of wire throughout her hair. And it's black leather motorcycle pants, a brown leather underbus, turtleneck. It's a great look. It's just amazing. But um, <laughs> she also- I'm a fan, I gotta say. I just in my mind's eye, you know. I feel like she's very like, put together and sleek at all times. Like her yeah. look has to be for her. Everything has to be coordinated and put together because presentation is part of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. So. Does she, uh, did I miss this? Does she have any uh, visible damage that she has decided to keep uh, like many others of her culture? She does. She has a scar. Ah. And it usually goes against to be on the face, but she doesn't think the scar takes away. It only adds to her beauty. That's really interesting. Okay, I, this is me now just riffing because this is not on our sheet, but now I'm curious. Okay, so does Sila have multiple faces like some other Montagini? Does she stick with the one? I guess we'll have to see. Okay, because I'm curious, here's, here's what I'm thinking, and I will share this with you and you can run with it or just completely purge it from the memory banks. I'm curious if she has multiple faces, if the scar exists on all of them, if because mm. a part of her was damaged in some way, the damage should shine through, you know, no matter what she looks or feels like that day, or or maybe not, maybe she is, different in that way and so only one of her faces has the scar and and maybe that's a little unusual uh it could be super cool either way and be uh like i said earlier a really great uh storytelling thread for either of us to pull on mm. you don't have to decide she... now also i think it's a cool thing to, to ruminate upon you know i think she's just in a constant state of correction mm. with certain body parts but I'm not going to touch on her faces just yet because okay. I want to give that more yeah. reverence. I love that. I think that's great. Things to think about. Very cool. Okay. Anything else we should know about Sila 919? Well, I guess it would go into what her traits are. Yes, oh my goodness, yes. I didn't move it in this thing, so we never did the skills. Yes, we've got at least two and up to six skill points that we should assign. I'm so sorry. Uh, you know where you want some of them to go? Mm. I would say no. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I think just keep an eye out, you know, as we go. Uh, and we're all, we're like I said, and I've said several times, we are all coming at this brand new. So if you want to hold on to all 12 uh, and assign them as we start playing, you just remember that you can do it. Cause I, I'm, there's no way I'm gonna keep track of everybody's remaining points. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but that's, that's fine with me. I think that'll be an interesting sort of little experiment to see how that goes. Yeah. And I said, we talked about like what the words were that describe her and I'm pretty sure I said them already, but they're dominant, bewitching and self-confident. Yes, thank you. That was the other thing. Dominant, bewitching, and self-confident. I love that. Okay. Anything else about Sila 919? Nope. 
I cannot wait to find out more as we play. I think that's a great start. All right. Three down, one to go. Now, if you all were paying attention, you will remember that I said earlier that the Manzagani were the last culture that we are going to talk about tonight that owes their existence to the arrival of the original Musalians. And that is true, but that doesn't mean that we are out of cultures. We do have one more culture that we're going to share with y'all tonight. We, I mentioned them, I said their sort of odd name once, way earlier when I was describing sort of the, uh, the general idea. Whoops, oh, oh, through the wormhole. Oh, oh, here we go, here we are, back through the wormhole, sorry about that. Uh, I mentioned very briefly this culture uh, that is native to uh, Musalia, or as they call it, Vatoa, and that is the hyena lay. Now, the hyena lay were the, the, the uh, native culture that gave assistance to the Musalians when they first arrived. Uh, and I mentioned that really briefly earlier, and it didn't get to the heart of just how essential the hyena lay were in the survival and evolution of the Musalians, particularly when they first arrived here on this planet. So the hyena lay, uh, thank you uh, for putting that spelling in the chat. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the hyena lay are humanoids that have the faces, tails, and feet, and sometimes a few other uh, a few other features of what we here on Earth might recognize as hyenas. They are native to, uh, as I said, Vatoa, which is their name for the planet. Uh, and they live in grand cities constructed from marble and onyx and gold. And at the center of most hyena lay cities is an enormous archive that houses both physical and digital records pertaining to every topic imaginal, imaginable. Now, a given city's archive may have a particular subject as its focus. For example, the archive of Primat Bay in the city of Ha Lins is primarily dedicated to information on trade skills and crafts. But even if a, an archive has a focus, all archives still contain a good amount of information on other topics, on all topics as well. If it isn't yet clear, the hyena lay culture is largely one that values scholarship and information. Again, not exclusively, because that's not the point. But in general, the culture as a whole values very highly scholarship. Many hyena lay strive to both understand and through their understanding, preserve all aspects of life by sharing stories and information and scholarship. It was that drive to preserve life and share information that moved some of those ancient hyena lay to take pity on the original Musalians and help them to learn where they were and to adapt and to survive. So these fascinating creatures are our native culture to the planet. And that brings us to our fourth and final, but certainly not least character creation of the evening. You ready, Tanya? Oh, yes. This is going to be All hilarious. Right. I'm so excited. All right, here we go. Got to ask the question. Got to ask the question, because I did for everybody else. Hey, Tanya, what culture is your character from? <laughs> Uh, hi I'm gonna mess this up even though it's our game. Hi and all hi Gabe is in I the had, chat. Gonna I had to me. practice and I had to ask Gabe who named these uh, this particular culture and confirm with him and I had to practice. It is the hyena lay. So just say hyena and then lay. <laughs> hyena lay. There you go. Uh yes. So uh what drew you, Tanya, to the hyena lay culture? Not <sighs> I wanted to do something different because, you know, uh, in other shows that I'm on, I play a human, and I'm like, eh, I get to be a human all the time. And this was something fun. And I also wanted to add a, a layer of subversion of trope with the way that we wrote them. Yeah. So it's, it's a little weird because I'm on the dev side of it too. So seeing the care the gay put into their lore and their city, I was like, that, that right there, that's what I want to do. So I just love the idea that we created this hyena race that is not just brilliant, yes. that they're the scholars, they're the librarians, they're the smart ones. Because a lot of people, when you think of a hyena, you don't think of intellect. So 
Absolutely. I was like, yes, let me go be one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I have a, a particular insight into some details about your character. Uh, so I am really excited for this particular, for this next question, which is, how does your Hainale character feel about being a part of that culture? They like it, but they're, they did not want to go sit in a dusty library or lab. Uh -huh. They're very much the one with wanderlust. And I'm more at home with a blade in my hand than a book. So while my friends were off studying lore, I was studying the blade. Yeah. And, you know, she's never been content to just sit and study. She's smart. She's definitely smart, but that's not her thing. She's like, I want action. I, I'm bored being in a lab, being in a library. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And it's still knowledge, right? It's still yep. learning. It's still information. It's just mm -hmm. not always in a book. Cool. Are there are there aspects? Uh, I mean, we just talked about that, how what you're doing is still learning. But are there other aspects of the Hainale culture, uh, traditions or values, lowercase v, uh, that your character either particularly ascribes to or particularly like tries to distance themselves from? Um, They still, like, she still believes in knowledge, except she doesn't she doesn't place knowledge over people she has friends mm. and she has had family and you know compatriots that are very much everything is about knowledge and about learning to the cost of the greater good like friends cool. that may have perished on an expedition because they had to go study this ancient thing despite the fact that oh a cave might fall on your head <laughs> or you know i'm going to leave my family for 20 years so i can go study these ancient runes and oh well bye deuces i i'm gonna leave my family i may mm -hmm. come back in 20 years i may not but she still loves to study just what she wants to so she right. will sit with a book if it's about martial skill if it's about you know learning various different ways in which to you know take out an enemy she'll sit there with a book for that she just isn't really partial engineering yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. I love that. Well, uh, I think uh, we may have some hints about this next question, uh, but why don't you uh, take away the suspense and what profession does your Heinle character uh, uh, study or practice? Uh, she is a blade keeper. Yeah, she is. Uh, well, you're a dev, so you know about the blade keepers. You want to talk about blade keepers? You want me to okay. talk about blade keepers? Uh, <clears throat> Let's not break the chain. I was like, you can talk about them and then I will get deep into the lore. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Blade Keepers are one of two sort of particularly combat focused uh, professions that we have created for this game. Um, the Blade Keeper is the uh, combat focused profession that focuses on weapons. And then we also have, which unfortunately none of us are playing, but we are also working on another combat class called the Spine Ripper, uh, gloriously evocative description, uh, that really is more of a hand-to-hand -hand fighter, uh, not so much in the weapons use. So the Blade Keepers, they're sort of uh, they have lots of different variations on this as their mantra, as their their you know uh, defining defining sort of uh, uh, well I don't want to say values because that means something in our game, but y'all know yeah. what I'm trying to say, which is keep your blade sharper, keep your blade sharp, your wit sharper, and your senses sharpest. The mm -hmm. blade keepers train to become one with their <laughs> weapons and be able to use them for all kinds of different purposes, right? Not always yeah. necessarily just to immediately kill, but yeah. at the ready at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. And it might be, and it, it might be a particular weapon that the blade keeper has trained with and values highly. But even in those situations, blade keepers are masters of all different types of weapons uh, and can and and you know often has multiple ones on them. Um, they are also, uh, they generally, and of course we'll talk a little bit about your character in particular's view on this, but they generally, it is not, though they are a very combat capable uh, profession, it's not about the battle, it is about the final strike. It is about the, the finishing of that battle, the victory, the, the end situation, not about the battle itself for the Blade Keeper in many cases. Does that all sound about right so far? Yeah, it's, you know, it's not about starting the fight, it's about finishing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so 
back to you, Tanya, as a person, what drew you to the uh, Blade Keeper profession? I've always been drawn to martial characters whenever I play an RPG. I rarely like to do healers or anything. And it's not that being a healer is bad, but you know, as a woman, a lot of people try to push you toward a healer class. So I have been determined to go literally the opposite direction of, oh, I can go kill things and have a big sword. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. The only reason I didn't go with spine rippers is because I wanted to have swords and not just be like literally a pugilist. Sure. Sure. Um, cool. We've talked a little bit about why your character uh, wanted to be a blade keeper because you've already mentioned that they were fascinated with and, and their learning was about weapons and combat. But what, uh, can you tell us anything else about uh, either why they chose blade keeper or how that choice went over with friends and family or anything about the, the decision-making process for your character there? Um, she just never wanted to wind up like a lot of her friends. She saw, she saw them as like chained books. Mm. And again, not that knowledge is bad. It's that that wasn't for her. That wasn't her jam from a young age. She liked to go fight and she liked to go brawl and, and not just to go beat people up, but it was like, she always believed in kind of educating with her fists and eventually knives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's nice enough until you cross her. And once sure. you're a friend, you're a friend forever, unless you cross her. So basically she's like the, you know how you have the one friend where if you call them, they're going to be on a plane, they're going to be on a, on a, in a car, in this case, on a spaceship. Like what you need, who made you cry? I'm on my way. Mm -hmm. She's that person. I love that. I think that's great. Um, so obviously there aren't, I don't want to say there aren't any, or and I don't even want to say there aren't many, but there are fewer hyena lay blade keepers than many other professions, we will say. Mm -hmm. um, so how did how did you train? Did you teach yourself? Was there another sort of oddball hyena lay blade keeper around that you trained from? Did you find someone from another culture to train you? How have you been how have you been training? So she was training with a couple of Masalians that she fell in with, a couple of Mansigene. And she'd heard that some other Hyenals, Hyenoles, I'm gonna mess it up, sorry. That's fine, um, I, I saw Jake Gabe say something in the chat and now I'm worried that I'm screwing it up. So we're gonna say that anything we say today is not canon and we'll fix it next week. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and you know, she 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 has Hyenol friends, but, like they're always busy studying, they're off exploring and like, she's excited for them. Like if one of her friends makes a discovery, she's all about it, but she's like, cool, enjoy that engineering. I got sparring in two hours and I got like a half hour walk. I'll see you later. <laughs> but she just fell in, like she watched them practice as she was growing up. And like, she, she was just like, that looks really dope. That's what I want to do uh -huh. versus I guess, I guess I'm gonna sit here with these formulas and like <laughs> read until I need glasses at 20, like the rest of my brethren. Cause sure. uh, you know, they live long compared to the Massalians, compared to the humans that have come to this planet. Yeah. So they're long lived. And she's like, look, I ain't trying to be like basically young wearing bifocals already. Cause I've spent my whole life staring at books. And the minute she could get away from it, she would sneak off and go train. And then her mom caught her, of course. And luckily her mom was all about that life. She's like, I'm not going to restrain you from doing what you do. Just mm -hmm. try not to get killed because we, we still care about you. But we see that you're not happy following our, our usual path. Great. I love that. Man. What? A tabletop role-playing game character with parents that are both alive and supportive? Goodness shocking <laughs> we're subverting look, all the tropes look i don't have that irl i gotta get it somewhere oh i love it i love it it's gonna be some good storytelling all right so uh heinle uh blade keeper you got a personality trait statement for us i i know what yours is unless it has changed and i love it <laughs> i know she's just super intense and in, and not in an aggressive way but like when she puts her mind to a thing 
she's there. That like that's what she's focused on in that moment. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, yeah, personality trait distinction intense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I and I think that uh, you know one of the sort of pros of having such a sort of simple statement that means so much is you'll be able to use that for, for good and ill. Uh, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's great. Um, cool, cool, cool. Okay, I'm gonna do this right this time. We now have our three <laughs> distinctions. We have yes. our Hyena Lay Blade Keeper who is intense. Uh, let's talk about skill steps. Uh, any that you know you want to apply? Um, well, I cheat a little bit because I'm a developer. So I gave myself D8 in weapons because, you yeah. know, I mean, she can fight with the bare hands if she's got to. But she's never without like her her blades and a dagger at her hip. So she's got she's always strapped up in the equivalent of being a blade keeper. Um, so so I want to talk a little bit about that because this is the first time that we have encountered the no skill and a specialization. I didn't talk about that too much when I was going through the overview of the cortex mechanics because it is a little bit of a corner case. Uh, mm -hmm. But I want to talk about it now because it's important that you have this. So. The no skill, right? To to give a skill that just is no. While we have created a creature, a, a culture of hyena people that do in fact know a little bit of everything, that's a little too general for us to for it to be super useful for us mechanically. So right now, specialization is one of the many cortex mods that you can add to your game. We're not adding it to our system quite yet except for the no skill. Uh, and players can, if they decide to step up the no skill, they can choose uh, any sort of specialization that narrows things down a little bit, uh, however they want. And they mm -hmm. can step up that specialization just like they would any other skill. So Tanya here has spent two of her uh, uh, um, skill step up points uh, to bring her weapon, her no weapons up to a D8. I think that's great. Uh, and you know, makes perfect sense because not only are you just someone good with a blade, but you are of a culture that studies to be good at things. And that does not only practical learning, but book learning for it. So I think that's perfect. Uh, any uh, other skills that you want to step up now? Um, I thought about survive or um, fix because even though she is more of a blade specialist, she's still got to get around. You know, yeah. the the world is not small enough to just walk on foot. <laughs> right. So you know, she could be sent on a mission after fix her fix a ride. So she didn't spend. She did learn something. She took all the engineering classes. She just didn't want to make it a profession. So, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so we can step up, survive. Uh, one step, two steps. How much? How many points do you want to spend here? Uh, one step in survive, and one step in fix. In fix, got it. All right, that is four points so far. I'm cool using up to six. You got any more you want to assign now? Uh, for now, no. Let's see what happens okay. with our story. Great, I love that. All right, so. We have our Hyena Lay Blade Keeper, who is intense, who is real knowledgeable about weapons and pretty good at fixing stuff and surviving. Uh, let's talk about, do you have some, we're, we're going to move over to signature assets. Uh, and I believe, sure. if I'm not mistaken, you have an asset already planned out. You want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah. So this was, uh, I'm blatantly just going to say it. It was my nod to Wakanda. Yeah, uh, do it. Aventera is a material found in far reaches. It's hard to find. And because metal is also kind of rare, depending on where you are on the planet, mm -hmm. I decided that this was kind of completely distinct, our vibranium, and she has a dagger from it. And it's very special for her. It's like her trainer gave it to her and yeah. she's never anywhere without it. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this asset uh, is a great example of what assets really can be, right? Obviously, just on a very practical level, our character has a dagger that they can, she can use to cut things, to cut people, to open things, you know, all kinds of things, right? And that is a narrative, narratively significant item that she has on her pretty much at all times. But it also tells us about her. It tells us it's from her mentor. So we know that she had a mentor that was very important to her mm -hmm. and that liked her enough to give her this gift. So that tells us something beyond just, oh, I can toss a D8 in when I want to cut somebody. Um, right. Now a D8 for the asset, I think is absolutely right, 
but I want I want us to figure out why it's a D8 and not a D6 or even a D4, right? Why is it that significant an asset? Well, narratively to her, it was obviously very important, but is there anything else about it? You talked about this, about, uh, about Aventera being sort of, you know, our version of fantasy super strong metals. So you want to tell us a little bit about the properties of it? Is it just that it's super durable? Can it do other things? I could toss out ideas, but I'm curious if you have anything in mind. It's, it's durable, but it also, it's, it's more than durable. You know, like, you know, like that one thing that you have where you're like, no matter what you do to it, it doesn't break. It doesn't tarnish. You've got, everyone's got like that one thing. Like mm -hmm. if you lose it, it always comes back to you. It's, and it's also yeah. got a bit of energy to it that she's never been able to figure out. Cool. And her mentor passed it to her because they sense that same energy in her. Not in the way that we talked about the Mansagene or the Slancy mm -hmm. or, the, or the Misajai, but it's, it's like, like when you touch something and you can get a sense of it for those that believe in kind of spirituality mm -hmm. and you just know like there's something about this. Someone who had this before, it meant a lot to them and they put their soul into it. Not in a literal sense, because that's creepy. Um, <laughs> but in a, this is meant to be with me way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. What, uh, this just came to me and it will make sense to why I'm asking this in a minute. What does Aventera look like? I am trying to look that up right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's my own fault. I should have had it ready. Um, so Aventera, actually, that was the other character art that you got to see during the break. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, she does look very much, she does look like a hyena. She's anthropomorphic. Oh, oh wait, hold on, hold on. I don't want to get to your physical description yet. I want to know what the metal Aventara looks like. Oh, the metal. I yeah, was yeah, going yeah. into my character description. Uh, you're so uh, ready, but we're not there yet. Don't rush me. <laughs> oh, um, I'm so excited about Vanessa's art. Um, I know, I am too. <laughs> so Aventara is a silvery gray, but it's got um, a black sheen to it, almost like obsidian. Where if oh, you looked cool. at it, you may take it as something fragile and brittle, but it's got that well-worn, battle-hardened look uh -huh. to it. Like, like this knife has been with you through thick and thin, Uh huh. but it's still got a shine to it and it's still sharp. Okay. And you said it's dark metal, yeah? Yeah. So it's, it's dark, cool. like, you know, like how um, iron ore kind of looks before it's polished and worked through. Sure, sure. So cool. Okay, great. I think that is all fantastic. And I want to, I want to add one thing about the dagger. Cause I really want to, I want to earn this D8. I think this dark sheen, it has a sheen, right? But, but it's mm -hmm. a dark metal, but I think sometimes, and you're not always at this point sure why or when it's going to happen, but every now and again, that blade, and it's always in times that it's really useful, whether to distract somebody or whatever, that blade will sometimes reflect light like a straight up mirror. Hmm. And, and it's happened where it's sitting, I don't know where it's, it's sit like on a, in a belt strap or where, where do you usually keep it? It's, it's kind of like, you know, like just like in the small of her back where she can mm -hmm. always kind of reach back and grab it. Yeah. And I think sometimes, I think maybe, uh, you know, you have been in situations where you were moving along through the world and something came out of the woods maybe and was coming for you. And that blade suddenly just reflected the light off of, you know, the sun coming down, blinded, temporarily blinded the creature that was coming out after you and you got away with it. It just, it doesn't, it's always helpful, but you're not, you can't control it. It is just sometimes shiny and reflective enough to be useful. Yes. And maybe that has to do with the energy you feel, but but it's such a confusing thing at this point to your character that you're not really sure. How's that sound? Yes, I like Great. that. Great. And we'll undoubtedly discover more about this dagger as we go on, but that's enough yes. to be starting off with. Okay, so we've got your signature asset, your single D8 signature asset. Let's talk about your values. I think we have a sense of this character. Uh, so how are we gonna how are we gonna break down our values? Ooh, well, knowledge. Um, I initially gave her a D10 because it's still very important to her. Mm -hmm. 
power is important because while she also while she believes in martial strength, she believes in intellectual strength as well. Mm-hmm. Um, she's curious and she has a sense of duty, which is why they both got a D6. Um, she has trained, but she's kind of willing to walk on the gray side of things if it will get the results she wants. Sure, sure. Yeah. All right, I think this looks good. So uh, knowledge still, you know, she grew up with Hainalei, so she's got that knowledge at the top. Balance is not so much a concern, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. More and more knowledge doesn't have to have a, a, a flip side for this character. You know, the more we can get, the better we can be and the better we can do. I think that's great. Um, you know, exploration is is going to be such a central theme to a lot of the stories that we tell in the Motherlands that I, I am very actually excited about the, the split we have among the four of you and how you value exploration. I think that's going to be real interesting. Um, and yeah, power and duty sort of both there in the middle. Great. All right. So we have this Hyenale Blade Keeper who is intense and we know a lot about her, uh, but we do not yet know her name. What is her name? Invicta. Invicta. I love that. And uh, you've used she, her pronouns, yeah, for Invicta? Yes. Great. And now, would you like to tell us what Invicta looks like? Sorry, I, <laughs> I, guess can't, look, I can't wait. You teased it and I'm super excited about it too, so go for it. I'm excited. Um, so she she looks like a hyena, an anthropomorphic hyena. Um, she's tall because they can be anywhere from like five foot-ish to almost seven feet tall. So she's about in the six foot range because IRL, I'm very short. So I like to be tall when I can be in games. Um, She's got brown and black fur and the thicker reddish brown fur in her head. She actually keeps braided to keep it out of the way. Yeah. And um, she has a bunch of hoops on her ears. Like they're small hoops. Just, you know, at some point she's like, I want to battle. I'm going to pierce my ear. And not like, and she's not like clanking around or anything, but she's got some (laughs) hoops in her ears. Sure. Um, and then she's actually got a stripe, a tan stripe on her muzzle from a oh. training accident. All right. And even though she's got fur, that strip always grows in super light tan. <laughs> um, and so she's got more like, you know, because hyenas are like kind of spotty, stripey. So mm-hmm. she she has the pattern of what a of what an earthling would look at a hyena and think. Mm-hmm. But she's not like super spotted or anything. Sure. Um, you know, and the and she keeps she has hair and it's it's growing out, but she keeps it in a braid, so it's like not in her way. She's out here fighting. She ain't got time for like frippery of of loose hair and all that. <laughs> No, no, she doesn't seem like she would, does she? I love that. I love that. And we, y'all saw, uh, if you were here during the break, you saw a sketch. The For you, it was sketches, right, that we had up? Yes. It's, yeah. It, I can't wait to see the color, but those ink sketches are fantastic. So that is our Invicta. Okay, anything else we should know about Invicta before we wrap this part? Um, no, I'm I'm very curious to see how our characters are going to interact because... Me too. We- <laughs> we all have kind of different ways of doing things and getting around stuff. Yeah. And uh, I, I've gotten to play with everyone except for Michael. Uh-huh. So it's either going to be high shenanigans or we're going to murder each other on our first mission. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Everybody get ready. <laughs> Session three will be another character creation episode because they all going to wow. be dead. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and wow. not from me. Uh, I love wow. that. I love that. All right. So, hey. That is a party. That is a party that we have put together and I am really excited about it. Let me just go through. I'm going to screw this up, but I want to do it anyway because I'm very excited about this. So uh, we have Ikembe, the Musalian bio-priest who believes that life is logical and values uh, knowledge above all. We have... I got to go over here and get this thing right because I don't want to screw this up. Okay, excellent. We have... I lie, the Misajai Lightbringer, who believes that we are all a community and who values balance above all else. We have Sila919, the Manzagene bio priest, who often tells people to either do it right or get out of her way, and who values power above all else. And then we have our uh, Invicta, our Hyenale Blade Keeper, who is intense and who also values knowledge above all else. What a 
cool i know this is a cheesy word but like i will say like what a neat group of people that i cannot wait to get to know better and tell stories with that is our character creation. We have about 15 minutes left and I am on the wrong document. So I don't know what happens next. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, we're I'm gonna tease a couple of things. I'm gonna tell you all what to expect in the coming weeks. And then we go wrap for tonight and we will see you all in seven days time. Uh, the thing I wanna tease, I've mentioned already, we're still working out some details, uh, but this is in fact a sci-fi setting, a sci-fi game, a sci-fi story that we're going to tell. And, you know, sci-fi wouldn't be complete if we don't do a bit of space shipping. So very early on, uh, probably pretty close to the beginning of next week, although I have some things to figure out, uh, our, our team here of four characters is going to get their hands on what will initially be called a temporary loan of a spaceship. And y'all, I am excited about this spaceship. I'm trying to think how much I want to tell you all. So first of all, I'm going to tease little bits. One of the things that's going to be really interesting about this spaceship, and I am for sure going to mispronounce this culture because it's the first time I've seen it was today, but this spaceship was built by a group of people that are called the Hathare. And I'm not going to tell you what the Hathare are. I will tell you that it is another culture that has some similarities to an earth animal and it's very big. And so one of the things that this crew is gonna have to sort of deal with as they shuttle about in their Hathare spaceship, uh, their Shakuna class Hathare spaceship, uh, is that it was built for people who are much bigger than most of them are. Uh, so that's gonna be sort of an interesting little uh, challenge first off. Um, one thing that I want the four of you to think about that if we had a little more time, we could we could play with a little bit now, but I don't think we want to do it tonight. Uh, but one thing that I want the four of you to look out for or think about before next week is what suggestions you might have for the name of this ship. Now we're hopefully going to have some, uh, some, I don't know that we'll have full on art, but we'll have some uh, concept sketches for the players and I'll have a more detailed description uh, for the stream next week about what this ship looks like very specifically. But in the meantime, think about what the name of this ship is going to be while you all are, are piloting it and using it to get around the cosmos. Uh, you may also want to think about what you will be doing uh, in this ship. Uh, presumably you will be doing more than sitting as a passive passenger, particularly if shit hits the fan, which of course it would never, I would never do that. Um, but there are stations for a captain, obviously, a, navigate, a navigator, there are some tactical weapon stations, there's a sensor station, and fortunately, and I'll go ahead and spoil this, there is an engineering bay, but the, uh, the Hathoray that that created this ship are gonna send an engineer along with y'all. Uh, Cause they, you know, it's still their ship and they're a little nervous. So they're gonna send an engineer with you all, but there are all kinds of other stations that uh, that you all can, can use and participate in and be a part of uh, on this ship. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanna say this week, but I think no, I think we'll move on from there and we will learn more about this spaceship uh, and the details about it next week. So. What is next? I've said this several times, I'm gonna say it again because I do think it is really important for the five of us that are playing to remember and all of you who are watching to remember. Into the Motherlands is still in development. We have had a wildly short time frame, right? To do a ton of work and our developers and our writers have been stunning. And I wanna shout them out uh, in just a minute uh, and thank them all, but it has been a lot to do, and there's no way that we could have created a complete setting and set of rule mechanics uh, in that amount of time. So we are still in development. This is an exploration and a development campaign that we're going to be doing. Things are going to change. There's going to be questions. We're going to bounce back and forth. So be ready for that and enjoy it. Enjoy getting to be a part of this part of the process of creating a new game. I'm super excited about it, and I hope all of you are as, are as well. 
Um, of course, we are going to kick off our story and gameplay next week. Uh, the fantastic Jasmine, you may know her as uh, that bronze girl on Twitch, has uh, given us an outline for a starting adventure that we're going to, that we are going to uh, begin with next week. And as we begin play, everybody has uh, at least eight. Looks like all of you have at least eight, and one of you has all 12 skill points. So we are still going to be fleshing out and learning about these characters narratively and mechanically as the weeks go on. Uh, so so be ready for that uh, and and get excited. Uh, I, I think... I think this is a really good place. I think we have done a lot. I think we've learned a lot. And I, I think this is a really good place to, to start saying our goodbyes for this week. Um, I, I just want to say, and I know we're all, uh, Tanya and I in particular, uh, since we're also on the dev side, are going to get a little up in our feelings here uh, for a moment. Uh, but I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, the four of you who are playing with me and who have sort of given me and Tanya and, and B. Dave Walters, our, our lead developer, have given us your trust uh, to do this new exciting thing. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank uh, 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 Leone, our incredible producer who has been so on the ball tonight. Thank you so much uh, to you for getting on all this together and for making us look good. Thank you to our entire design and writing team. Uh, you know, B. Dave Walters is our uh, lead developer. And of course, Tanya here is our creative director. Uh, we have designers, uh, Tanya, before I say people's names, was there anyone that I shouldn't say names for? Uh, is there anyone who prefers us not to say their names? I don't On the think dev team? On the dev team, yeah. No. Okay, so uh, we have uh, Gabe uh, from, uh, you may know him as Gabe, J Gabe James Games, uh, phenomenal developer who has done so much work in the world building and the lore here. Sharang Biswas, also incredible work on some of our cultures and our professional uh, our cultures, I believe, is mostly where uh, where Sharang was was focused. We also have uh, writers on the team. I already mentioned Jasmine, that bronze girl on Twitch, adventure writer. We also have Latia, uh, at, who I'm blanking on her Twitter handle right now. Uh, Jeez. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who's also working on an adventure for us. Um, who have I forgotten from the dev team? Did I get everybody? I think so. Yes. I'm like, yep. now that you asked me that, I'm like- I know, right? I'm gonna, go through the, I'm gonna go through our Slack and make sure I hit everybody. Uh, <laughs> um, and of course, I wanna thank all of you who have been here tonight. This has been your, your support, your being here, your active in the chat, sharing of this, getting the word out and continuing to support us is, is incredible. I, I, I cannot thank you all enough for being here for as much as the players are for trusting us to give you something fun and entertaining and interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, fun and entertaining and interesting and for coming with us on this development journey that we are all sort of on together. I am looking through our page of creators on the website. Yes, of course. There, uh, we also, we've, I've, we've mentioned uh, her so many times tonight, but I am, I apologize profusely to uh, Vanessa Pleasantly Twisted, who is our lead artist, who is doing the character art for all of our characters. I cannot wait for you all to see the rest of that art. And um, uh, Will Wiggins, Black Oni, uh, who is our cover artist as well, who's done some really cool cover art for us uh, that, that we're gonna be putting out to you all. So thank you both to those two amazing artists. Um, yeah, I want to be sure that everybody has time to uh, remind us all, uh, you know, who you are, where you come from, what you're doing. Uh, so let's do that. And then I will blaze through sponsor thank yous and then we'll get out of here. Uh, let's go around same order that we did when we started. So Tanya, you want to start us off? Let us know who you are, where we can find you and what else you're up to. I'm doing far too much. Um, <laughs> obviously, you can find me here on Sundays for Into the Motherlands the next uh, 11 weeks. And next Sunday... So I'm doing two things on Sunday. Uh, I'm the DM for Rose War Deep season eight. We start October 11th, so 10 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Central. Hopefully I don't get us all killed as a DM, we'll see. Uh, Thursdays, we have two sessions left of the Dragon Age RPG where we flip the tables and Eugenia is a player and I'm the GM. That's right. And then on Saturdays, um, I am the DM for Dungeon Crossing where we take D&D, &D, but put it into uh, Animal Tor Animal crossing with gary witta shannon woodward brian gray and adam nickerson and that is uh, every other saturday we've got a few more sessions planned out and then of course i stream here normally so come hang out we're not doing this and uh we're we're thinking about trying to do like kind of a a post 
session, maybe discussion, middle of the week, see how that works out because people have jobs and stream and have lives outside of the stream for three hours a week. Yeah, but follow me on Twitter, Cypher of Tears, my handle everywhere, and uh, I'm excited. I'm going to probably go in a corner somewhere and cry once the stream is over, but tears of happiness. Same. All right. Yes. Follow all the things, watch all the things. Sundays is busy, uh, but busy with awesome stuff. All right. Uh, Christina, you want to you wanna give us a little outro? Now it's time to say goodbye. No, um, my yeah, name is. is Christina. <laughs> my name is Christina Ariel, and you can find me obviously here on Sundays for the next 12 weeks or 11 weeks hanging out with my friends. And you can find me on Mondays for Rise of the Veiled Alliance at 3 p.m. with Michael, who plays with me. Shut up, Edel. But um, you can also find me on Wednesdays for the next three weeks at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Dimension 20s. Why did I just forget the name wrong? I'm not on the show. Pirates of uh, the Fire. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh I'll tell you what it is. I'll help you out. I don't remember either. <laughs> oh my God. I like, let me remember all the stuff I'm involved in right now. And also, I've got another thing coming out called Improvised Champions with Mr. Mark Meir. And we are going to be doing that. And that's going to be super exciting. We will be doing voiceovers for all the characters in Idol Champions. And I just have a lot of stuff going on. And I hope you support it. Follow me on Twitter if you want to see the things. And also Instagram because I post cute pictures of my family and my fights. Yes. Yes. Wait, that Idol Champions voiceover project sounds awesome. I can't wait to find out more about that. That's awesome. I love it. All right. Uh, next up, DJ. Hi, I'm DJ Knight. I am a full-time Twitch broadcaster. So outside of being here for the next 11 weeks, if you don't count today, because, you know, we're almost done. Uh, I'm generally live Monday through Friday, noon to 6 p.m. Central. And I like to play a lot of space and sci-fi games. Lately, we've been playing a lot of Elite Dangerous uh, about to get in some more Star Citizen, and we've been playing a lot of Star Wars Squadrons, where I've been basically telling everybody in the chat, I need the game. Oh, I'm to play. Do the things. It's been pretty awesome, and uh, yes, I use a lot of voice modulation with the Go XLR. It's kind of my bee's knees. I'm also DJ Nine on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So that's basically where I'm at. You'll see me there. Thanks for coming to hang out with us, and I am super excited about the next. 11 weeks i can't wait to play yeah me too all right michael hey 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 folks uh yeah so um michael sinclair the second uh i go by michael crits everywhere uh as christina said you can find me on looking for more uh, networks channel on mondays uh in the um journey to obsidian spire i am also part of Fayforge forge academy which on uh, podcast which comes out every friday as besky a celestial teenage boy who's super cool and light bright and shiny uh on my personal twitch channel also michael crits uh i play lots of magic the gathering and i'm starting to get back into world of warcraft i don't know why i'm also a comp sci major and a professional uh role player so i don't know why i find all the time here but i do um, i'm glad you do I appreciate it. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, all of me. Uh, like I said, Twitter, uh, I'm starting to post back on Instagram. I'll try. Um, and that's me. All right. And once again, I have been and will be for a little while, at least your storyteller. Uh, I'm Eugenio Vargas. You can find me on Twitter at at DM Jazzy Hands. Uh, I am the dungeon master and producer of an actual play D&D podcast that comes out weekly on Wednesdays called The Last Refuge. Uh, we just had our third anniversary, holy hell. Uh, so you can check us out at, at DND Last Refuge on Twitter. Like I said, new episodes every Wednesday there. Uh, let's see, I do stream also here on Twitch on my own stuff, mostly playing Dragon Age and uh, waiting with bated breath for the upcoming Baldur's Gate early access, Baldur's Gate 3 next week. Uh, so that's mostly what you can find me playing on my channel over at twitch.tv slash dm jazzy hands uh let's see thursdays like tanya said we got two more weeks of a fun dragon age stream that you can catch us on in reversed roles uh i'm also starting a couple of other rpg streams uh in the coming weeks one on monday nights that i cannot say anything about yet and one on tuesday nights uh that's going to be on mini terrain domains channel uh we are going to be playing through the module harper's tale uh which is a really beautiful story about um uh, uh love and loss and well-being and and finding uh finding a path through difficult uh personal circumstances uh which makes it sound super dark and depressing but it's gonna be a lot of fun uh so come check us out every other tuesday on uh, on mini terrain domains channel but you can find all of that out on 
on my Twitters. Uh, all right, I think I think that's me uh, for the evening. I do want to really quickly once again run through our amazing sponsors and thank them. Die Hard Dice uh, is going to be releasing the beautiful Musalian Skies Dice Set. Keep an eye uh, on their Twitter and their website, dieharddice.com. Blue Microphones is providing the cast with upgrades so that we sound as good as absolutely possible, musalianly possible. Uh, and, and I've been using their microphones for podcasting for years. You can check out their products at bluemic.com. Absolutely have to uh, thank the folks at Cortex and at Fandom for allowing us to use uh, their system to prime our game with Cortex. Uh, very excited about what we're gonna be able to do with that system and all the other things that Fandom has planned for that system uh, in the coming weeks and months. Very excited there. And of course, we have to thank Twitch uh, for supporting this, for getting this off the ground, for allowing us to be here, uh, for hyping us and for letting us do our thing. Very, very grateful to that. Y'all, once again, Thank all of you. Uh, we are so happy to be here with all of you. We are so happy to have you all join us on this journey into the motherlands. Can't say thank you enough. We hope that we see all of you again next week at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. You can do the other time zone conversions. I am bad at it, but we will see you same time, same place right here for session one of Into the Motherlands. In the meantime, the way I sign off all of my streams is to wish you all uh, the following things. Please be safe, please be healthy, please wear a mask and happy gaming, y'all. Okay. That's all right. That Don't go anywhere. We're going to go raid one of the fam, Pro uh, yeah. Actually, let Here me make sure go. he's still on. Oh. <laughs> Can someone Pace make sure he's still on? Pants. He is. He's on. Oh, yes. Let's go raid Pro Man, the Pro uh, is big. Yes. Oh, yeah. Credits. Let's see if I can do that. Even though I'm not on. Hopefully, credits will roll. I think we know our mics are hot, Das Biff. Thanks, though. Yeah, we know. <laughs> I figured as much. Oh yeah, we all we yeah. you look a little behind the scenes for y'all. Stick around because we want I you to be talking with about us. the poop would be just fitting about the situation. <laughs> That's right. That's He's right. gonna poop his pants. We are Tiger it. Vision. We are. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for being here. Uh, if you're a sub, we are going to go raid and love on Pro Quesadilla. Yeah. He's already playing a scary game, so let's go show up and give him all the love and watch his face. Ooh, let's do it. When he yeah, sees this number of folks coming in. He's got to poop his pants. We were climbing the Give us the poop. Help us do it. All right, see you over in Pro Cassidy's room. See you next week. Bye.